one thing that I'll mention today, we did the Skype with um, the firm from Oregon. It worked out really well, except that the speaker is, is there. So that's why we have these mics. It's really important. We tested it at each. Yep. Okay. She could hear it. Okay. And I cannot obviously repeat the question because I'm going to be sitting up there to help her with her presentation, but to speak directly into the mic. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor and uh, City Council members. Um, so tonight we'll be interviewing three firms that you have selected. Um, the interviews for each firm should last approximately 50 minutes so that we're able to transition into each one. Is, I don't know if yours is on. I, did, I wasn't using it either, so is it on? It looks like it is. Can there you, you go. There. Oh, see, I wasn't following my own instructions to talk directly into the mic. There you go. There we go. All right. So tonight, I'll repeat, we're going to be uh, meeting with three firms um, that have submitted proposals for the Englewood Environmental Foundation audit. Um, each interview should last approximately 50 minutes so that we're able to transition into uh, the, uh, the subsequent uh, vendor. The format of each discussion will be as follows. Um, there will be a 15-minute in introduction. Each vendor has prepared a presentation. There will be a 30-minute question and answer period. Uh, we were, I did provide uh, five questions to you previous to tonight, but then they're also listed on the sheet. The sheet has been prepared or presented to the city clerk, so it will be on uh, the website tomorrow. And then there will be a five-minute discussion uh, with um, uh, with each uh, with each vendor um, before they depart. And then we'll um, at the conclusion we'll talk about next steps um, and and how you would direct me to move forward with that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and the way we'll go through these questions then is we'll start going around and then when it ends with number five, then the next person will we'll start with one the next time around and just keep going. Does that make sense? And we can do follow-up questions, so if you feel like something wasn't clear, it's fine to ask another, another question. Any questions from council? No, okay, great. I think we'll wait a few more minutes because I, th I do think Mayor Portem was hoping to be here by six at least. But if not, we'll we'll begin. And she said to go ahead and start. She has quite a I think she has quite a travel time, but hopefully she'll make it through quickly. I'm going to excuse myself for just a minute to make sure that um, our first presenters are, are ready to go. Okay. Uh, Mayor, I guess I do have one quick question. Are we going sure. around on the questions or yeah. are you just asking? Okay. Yeah, so I'll start with you. You can have number one, two, three, four, five, and then okay. one, two, three, and then, okay, we'll just keep, if I forget, remind me. Sam, do you want us to turn these off when we're not speaking, or does it matter? Put it down? Okay. Stop the mic. But yeah, just make sure you're speaking very
We're just waiting for one more, but I think we'll start in a minute as soon as at least Councilmember Barentine gets here. Welcome. Thank you for being here tonight for the EF audit um, interviews. Appreciate it. I, I think what we'll do is go around and have each one of us introduce ourselves. We have a sick, our seventh member that's supposed to be on her way, but we're going to go ahead and start because we've we've told you to be here. <laughs> so maybe Councilmember Martinez can start sure. out. And hi, I'm Amy Martinez, Councilmember at Large. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Wink, and I'm a Councilmember at Large as well. Good evening, Dave Cuesta, District Four. And I'm uh, Linda Olson, District 2 and Mayor. Lorette Barentine, District 3. Good evening. Othaniel Sierra, District 1. Thank you. Take it away. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'd like to introduce Ide Bailey, uh, one of the vendors who has prepared a proposal for RFP 1845, Englewood Environmental Foundation Audit. Um, I will start by introducing Kimberly Higgins. She's a partner, and she will introduce the rest of her team and get settled for the presentation. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. We're going to do a little musical chairs here, and That's then fine. You, and you really have to talk right into it. These okay. are. Can you hear me better now? There you go. Okay, great. We do have a presentation for you tonight. Before we do that, though, we'd like to introduce ourselves. My name is Kim Higgins. I am listed as the engagement partner in the proposal. Uh, what that means basically is that um, I will be the lead on communications, on helping to coordinate, strategize, uh, discuss, meet with you, meet with uh, liaisons, and also be able to coordinate the engagement team on the engagements that we would be carrying out for the city and EF. Um, my name is Kim Higgins. I have been with Ide Bailey since uh, 2004. Realistically, we actually merged with Ide Bailey in 2008. I've been in Colorado, even though I may not sound like it, <laughs> since 1980. Um, so I have spent the majority of my career in Colorado. I primarily, I am the government director for Ide Bailey. I only work with governmental entities and nonprofit organizations. They usually fold into governmental entities. I have uh, been the director of governmental auditing and internal auditing and consulting in Colorado since I started with Ide Bailey in 2008. Uh, we have a um, um, a unique firm, I would say, because of, of the top 20 firms in the nation, you don't find many that have governmental practices that are as large as ours. We have, we're a top five practice in Ide Bailey, uh, so that really allows you to see our experience. Um, I also want to introduce our team, which next is? Hi. Uh, my name is Doug Cash. I'm a, uh, I guess, one of your specialists. I'm a forensic accounting uh, senior manager. My background's a little different than most accountants. Um, I spent almost 30 years in law enforcement, working mainly uh, white collar crime, and I've been with Ide Bailey now for the last 12 years, uh, working all types of investigations um, and helping clients either determine what happened, help them protect themselves, and determine you know, other aspects of it. I'm a certified fraud examiner, a certified forensic interviewer, and a certified uh, financial crime investigator, and I have uh, dual masters, one in business and one in criminal justice. Uh, my primary goal would be able to assist you on either an internal control examination, which we'll discuss later, or a forensic exam. I would be uh, your primary contact on that in regards to uh, making sure that all that gets done properly, um, and I'll answer the other questions later, and I'll turn it over to my other colleague. Hi, I'm Audrey Donovan, and I am a career internal auditor. That means I've been in the profession roughly 25 years. I am a certified internal auditor, certified government audit professional, and certified risk management assurance. 
I am here today as the internal audit side of the engagement to speak with you about the difference between internal audit and an internal controls or fraud examination. I've uh, been with the firm now for a year. I have been a director at Clifton Larson Allen at the city and county of Denver in their performance audit department. And prior to that was at PwC and Ernst & Young. So long history and in internal audit, many projects, many performance audits as well as internal audits. So we have prepared a presentation for you. Um, now my understanding, and I know that we were scheduled to meet during the cyclone bomb that hit <laughs> and that delayed. At that point in time, my understanding was that we had 15 minutes to do a presentation and then 30 minutes to answer questions. And quite frankly, um, however you'd like to do it, we've prepared our presentation based on uh, research, listening to your council meetings, uh, preparing our proposal, having discussions uh, over the several months that we've been in preparation to come before you. So feel free to ask questions or have us go through the presentation and then ask your questions afterwards. However you'd like for us to do that, we're prepared to proceed. So do you have a preference? My, I think our I think we work better if you would give us your presentation and then we ask questions. Okay. Because otherwise right. we could get you sidetracked pretty quickly. But I think it would be best in your interest to, to share your 10 to 15 minute and then if you're okay with all that. Does Absolutely. Anybody? Yeah. We okay. are too. Okay. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint presentation that's up there. What we, um, the, first, the first thing that we're going to uh, try to take you through, um, I am going to turn over to Audrey. Oh, it works. That's great. <laughs> all right, so we wanted to address all the questions that you had for us, and Maria was kind enough to inform us in advance of the questions that we would be looking to address. Um, obviously, through our presentation, we're going to describe the unique um, nuances between internal audit as well as an ICE or a fraud investigation. So we're going to talk a little bit about the statement of work. We've talked a little bit about our backgrounds and our qualifications, but you'll hear a little bit more about that, as well as anticipated schedule. We know through the RFP you were looking to kick off this engagement last month, so we're looking at maybe sometime this month or the following month, but still looking at an aggressive timeline is my anticipation. Um, and then the approach, so getting into um, different ways that we can go about doing this work and really just kick it off from there and turn over to Kim. So after doing quite a bit of research, reading articles, um, listening in on your council meetings, as you were discussing this RFP and the different proposals, which we've done, uh, we put together obviously our proposal and uh, our statement of work, listening in and trying to anticipate the types of things that you might ask us to do. So we have three services, which is why the three of us are at the table, that we heard from you. One was internal audit. Uh, the other was an internal controls engagement, which is unique to us, but something that we believe that you may also want to hear about. And then a fraud or forensics approach. So that's what we're going to be talking about from our standpoint. And we're capable of performing all three. That's really why we priced our proposal the way we priced it, so that we could come in and talk to you, listen to you further, determine do you really want an internal audit, which is an assessment of risk and taking a look at different areas, or do you want an internal control engagement, which is really a targeted area of going in and looking at internal controls, or do you suspect that you've got transactions that have happened that uh, are suspect, possibly fraudulent? And so depending upon how you believe, and you are much closer to the situation than we are, how you'd like to proceed, we could do any one of those three. So internal audit, that would typically starts off with a preliminary risk assessment. In this case, it would be over Inglewood Environmental Foundation, looking at all the accounting transactions, con the contracts, 
um, based on your RFP going back to the inception of EVE, so August 14, 1997. This would look at um, preliminary areas where risk could occur, and from there building out an audit plan, looking at from a data perspective where we need to further fine tune the areas to look at from a risk perspective. From that angle, if we start to see fraud, um, whether that's in contracts, accounts payable, um, improper authorizations of contracts or payables, that's when myself and Doug would start to collaborate and start working together, at which point, as Kim had mentioned, if we already know up front there's a potential for fraud, it really doesn't make sense to do the initial risk assessment and start testing in the audit plan to get down to the area that we've already identified as fraud. As you can see, there could be roughly 60 hours wasted to get to a point where we already know there's nefarious activities or areas that we feel that we should focus on in that, in that manner. But if it's truly just an internal audit, this is the approach we would take. Preliminary risk assessment, develop our audit plan, test in those areas of highest risk, develop field work in the documentation to support the testing, report on that, and then have follow-up activities to show that remediated action has been implemented. In regards to uh, an internal control examination, the one thing I want to make sure we point out right up th at the point here is that an internal control examination, or ICE as we call it, is designed to s say what your current controls are. They are not designed to go back in the past. A internal control exam, or an ICE, is designed to look for any opportunities that exist for people to manipulate the system and to take advantage of that. It does not tell you whether um, that manipulation has taken place. To be able to do that is where we have to go into a fraud exam. But an ICE is designed to go in and do in-depth interviewing with your accounting people to determine what policies and procedures they have, how they follow them, and basically how the money flows, and to see if there's any indication or any opportunities for, for people to manipulate that and take advantage of that. If there is obvious ways for people to take advantage of their position, we would then come to you and suggest that you go further and go into a, uh, a fraud exam. A fraud exam is a very unique um, thing. Probably the easiest way to explain it is a forensic exam, a fraud exam, forensic audit, whatever you'd like to call it, is designed not to sample. We look at everything. Um, as I explain when I uh, speak publicly, uh, auditors sample we do not. If you give us five boxes of documents, we will look at all five boxes, every piece of paper front and back, and probably ask you for more. So if you really want to understand what took place, that is what a fraud exam is, is designed. It also is designed to do a specific area. Uh, because of the amount of transactions and stuff that you have or some people have, you may want to limit that to three or four years and then see if you want to go back further. Now, we do ha have the understanding you wish to go back to inception, and our understanding is, is that the number of transactions was taken into account in our bid, so we should be able to go back to exception or to the beginning and to go through every single transaction. The other thing I want to explain, the kind of the difference between what I do as a fraud examiner, is that if there would be some type of litigation that needs to be done, we would act as your expert witnesses. We would be the ones that would be testifying on behalf of what was found. That's unique in a, an accounting firm that auditors, either, um, either one of my colleagues, they do not do. As a certified fraud examiner, that's specifically what we design things to do, is to give you the answers and resolve any allegations of something did take place or it didn't take place, and to be able to prepare that for any type of litigation if necessary and, and to be able to do that. I have testified as an expert witness in two different states and have been on the stand many times, obviously, as a law enforcement officer and as a forensic accountant, so to be able to do that. Um, the One of the unique things in reference to our group is we have a huge amount of expertise. As you can see, a few of them there, certified fraud examiners, certified in forensic, um, financial forensics, interviewers, CPAs, business valuation, several law enforcement agencies. We're also very unique is that we have three full-time computer forensic labs 
that we are able to go through computers, cell phones, laptops, anything like that if need be to be able to pull information off, save, and that is all in, uh, admissible into court. We also have, um, you know, in case uh, any type of the forensic, computer forensic engagements that we have specialists in that, uh, in case security uh, breach, uh, security breaches, any of those kind of things. A forensic exam is very unique and from what I can tell that you were looking at, my, it appears that that's probably the way that you want to go down because you want to be able to resolve whatever concerns you have and to be able to get the answers that you're from behind that. The anticipated schedule that is in the proposal um, actually would have started in March and concluded in June. That's what we were looking at. Uh, and we believe a phased in approach is what the best approach would be so that phase one is basically the interviewing process. So no matter what you pick that you would like for us to do, whether it's an internal audit or an ICE engagement or a fraud engagement, we would be interviewing people. So phase one is going to take effect for any of those types of engagements. Phase two is we would think would happen, phase one would we think would happen in May. Phase two we think would happen in June, three, July, uh, four, July, August timeframe. So we're looking at the hours depending upon what you pick uh, to really conclude by August, if possible, July, depending upon the information that we need, the number of people that we need to interview, the number of transactions that we need to look at, what type of service that you might pick. So that's how we structured the engagements when we actually looked at the pricing. And our pricing in, in the proposal is a top set of 73,340 and a bottom set of 49,400. The reason for that range is to give you the latitude to pick what you want us to do. And phase two is the risk assessment. If we're going to do an internal audit, we're going to do a risk assessment. If we're going to do a fraud engagement, we'll do a fraud risk type of it, assessment. So those things would more than likely take place with those two. An ICE engagement is more focused on an area that you would tell us to go to if you believe there are weaknesses. And so there may be some risk assessment there, but more than likely that's going to be a very targeted, and it could be very targeted in five different areas or three different areas. Uh, an internal audit is more global, as is a fraud engagement, as you heard Doug talk about, is 100%. So fraud doesn't sample. Everything else really does or is more targeted. Phase three is the testing and the examination after all of the data has been gathered. We will then be going through and looking at it based on what we believe has happened. If it's 100% fraud, we're going to be looking at contracts. We're going to be looking at compliance. We're going to be reading those. We're going to be determining whether uh, there were approvals, where the, where the engagement may break down or the transactions have broken down. We're looking at everything from that standpoint, and that's really phase three. And then phase four, we get into, three and four, we get into the reporting, the follow-up, the reporting, the coming back to you, the talking with you about this is what we're seeing, this is what we're finding, and then final reporting to you and, and close out. Uh, so that's the way we usually structure our engagements in this instance. If you look at that and you look at the hours, we're looking at a blended hourly rate of right around $190 an hour. Now, one of the things that CPA firms do is we look at our hourly rates every year. Our, I, I will say to you that our, we will stick with that hourly rate. Our fiscal year end is April 30. So those rates are changing as of May 1. But because we, we've entered into this proposal, we're not going to change anything. But quite frankly, uh, to get a fraud examiner at $190 an hour is, um, as I've talked with Doug, that's too low in my opinion. But, but it's, a good, it's a good thing for our clients. Um, and so we have uh, references, we have examples of reports that we can show you on an ICE agreement or fraud engagements or those type of things. And, and so I, I wanted you to know that that anticipated schedule is flexible and can move, obviously, based on the timing of what we're talking about. Oops. 
All right. Is that? No, we're one more. We have one more. Okay, great. This is just a wrap up of what Kim had indicated, the different phases, planning, internal audit, testing, or ICE or forensic testing, and then reporting. So the details are fleshed out here more in this particular slide. And I believe that is it. In, in closing, we are excited to be here. We are thrilled that we have a seat at the table. This is a great opportunity, one in which Kim had mentioned before, we have researched, we know where the backstory lies uh, since inception. This has been an interesting foundation, the way that it was formed and set up, and we're just thrilled to be here. So thank you. Thank you, and as you've seen, we have a new member that made it, and so do you want to introduce yourself? We all went around already and just said our name and where we serve. <laughs> okay, area. I apologize for being late. Um, my name is Rita Russell, I'm Mayor Pro Tem, and I serve as an at-large council member. It's nice to have you, thank you. Great, so, we're, so we have a set of questions that we're gonna operate with and start, I think, with Council Member Cuesta because we'd agreed to that. So um, Mayor Pro Tem, we're gonna start there and come around and then we'll just keep doing that. And feel free to add, ask a follow-up if we want, but let's be conscious of our time because we wanna give them more. So Council Member Cuesta. You bet, uh, so the first question is, please describe to your understanding uh, what is requested of this audit. When we read the RFP, uh, we saw that you were looking at uh, an internal audit. Um, you explained EF uh, and the relationship. We obviously delved in more to find out what's going on because we deal in the profession with governmental entities requesting internal audits now more and more. And sometimes internal audit means different things to different people. And so after listening to the council meetings that we listened to and talking about internal audit, uh, we believe that there were several things going on. And in the discussions, heard fraud, uh, heard internal audit, heard discussions about what should be first, second, third. And because we do this type of work uh, all the time, we wanted to bring to the table what we heard, internal audit, also an ICE engagement, which is probably new to you in hearing that, which is internal audit and ICE are present day type of situations where you assess risk and you take that risk and examine or audit transactions from there. In listening to the council meetings, we believe that you already knew the risk. And so to do an internal audit and you already know the risk, it could either be a, a traditional internal audit or what we call a non-traditional internal audit, depending upon how you define the risk. But we also heard fraud, so we also wanted to bring that engagement to the table. And so from looking at the RFP to listening to the council meetings, that's how we developed our proposal and brought it to you. And we thought that uh, that would be the best type of dialogue that we could have for you today. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, please describe in detail similar audits to the one we've, we are interested in that you've conducted. And you spoke to this a bit earlier, but perhaps in a bit more detail. Sure. Probably one of the best examples that we've done for a government uh, entity here in Colorado is, I can actually use their name because they've given me permission, is for the town of Castle Rock. They had a concern that um, their controls possibly were not as good as they wanted them to be. So they asked us to come in and we went through every single department in their city, did just over 70 interviews, tested a bunch of information, brought in our computer forensic people to look for any type of potential uh, vulnerabilities in that, uh, their system for where they could be hacked or those kind of things. And when we were said and done, we provided them a set of recommendations to be able to secure that so that uh, they were able to, when they were asked, what are you doing to protect our assets? This is what we're doing. We, our controls have been checked. We believe they're adequate. Well, they brought in I Bailey to be able to do that, and so that's what happened. That's on an ICE exam. On a fraud exam, we've gone into um, governments, counties, uh, school districts, and be able to go in and decide what actually transpired to be able to see who did what and hold people accountable and take those cases 
either to uh, litigation or internal, whatever they wish to, with successful results. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councilmember Martinez. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, you addressed this in your introductions, but uh, if you want to expand on it at all, uh, please describe qualifications of staff members to conduct the audit. Yes, um, in our proposal we have uh, several technical specialists, three sitting at the table with you, and um, I think that's one of the things that we excel at is bringing resources to the table. So depending upon how the discussions would proceed with you, um, Audrey is our specialist in internal audit, Doug is our specialist in forensics, we also have several specialists listed in the proposal that are IT, cybersecurity related. So what we try to bring to the table are those specialists that can actually look and listen to what you need or want, and we can develop what we believe the service should be to provide to you. And if anything else comes out of that, like you're concerned about um, a former employee's computer or phones or you want somebody to take a look at the laptop or the computers, then we could bring in our IT specialists to look at those things to determine transactions or different types of what, whatever might be on their laptop or, or their phone or that type of thing. Uh, so I think from a standpoint of bringing those resources to the table and who are mentioned in our proposal that the resources are here in Colorado, which is nice. Uh, we don't hail from anywhere outside of the state. We all live here. <laughs> um, and that, that's why we're present and believe that we have the resources to bring to the table for whatever might come up. And if we don't, we also know where to go get them. Thank you, Council Member Sierra. Good evening. Uh, could you please uh, review the details of the audit cost and the timeline as submitted in the proposal? Yes, um, that actually, let me just go back here. This is what the anticipated schedule is and, and what's listed in the proposal. Um, you can see here that we've done this through a phasing type of approach, phase one, phase two, phase three, and that's really the way we try four and phase four. That's the way we tried to break this down so that you could see what we believe the hours and the phases entailed. So if you look at phase one, uh, we're looking at 40 to 60 hours of interviewing. And that would be the very beginning. We would sit down, we would talk to you all, we would talk to whoever the liaison might be in this engagement. We would want to know, probably talk with the three EF board members, talk with you guys, figure out who we need to talk to to understand what the accounting and the transactions and the controls that are in place and functioning now and how they have been in the past and where you want to go with that. And that's broken down that way. Again, if, if a bl our blended hourly rates are $190 an hour, so whoever you're getting here, that's how this was priced. Uh, and if we use that entire, entire 40 to 60 hours, which I believe we would in interviewing people, then that would be the first phase. You take that times $190 an hour, and that's the first phase, and that's how you would get to it. And so the low end is 190 and the high end is 190 and that's how we've priced it and how we came up with our 49.4 and our 73.340. So depending upon the type of engagement in phase two, that is where we talked about if it's an internal audit, we're, gonna, we're going to assess risk. If it's a forensics audit or a fraud risk assessment, we're going to do the fraud risk assessment. If it's an ICE engagement, we're going to be able to do probably less from a risk standpoint because you're pointing us in that direction. So whatever type of engagement will range somewhere between that 100 to 150 hours to determine risk and assess risk. And after we assess risk, then we understand, or if we've targeted risk, or if it's a fraud engagement, then we're doing 100% transactions in a fraud. If it's risk-based, we're doing something less than that, but we're targeting wherever we're going, and that's phase three of the actual testing work, examination. And we think that'll take 100 to 150 hours. And then the final phase is the actual reporting and the follow-up and the closing meeting that we would have with you to report on what we're doing. 
and we also like to report as we're going through the process. So depending upon how you like to work, we like to work with our boards and our management on a weekly basis to report in, whether that's a written type of situation or a face-to-face -face meeting or a call. We like to engage the boards and the management because we want you to know what we're doing. We want you to know uh, whether we're getting everything that we need. We want you to know, you know whether we've got delays. We want you to know all of that. And, and you are where the buck stops here. So we believe that if we're in communication with you that, and you understand that we're struggling with something, you can make that happen for us. And that's why we like that communication style. Does that answer your question on how? Thank yes, okay. Thank you, Council Member Barentine. Could you describe how the audit process will work? I'm going to assume that you're going to do a combination of internal audit slash fraud investigation. We're going to start the engagement with our planning phase, and that's going to be requesting a lot of information. There's a lot of documentation, um, policies and procedures, manuals, a basic understanding of the process, interviewing the folks in over the board, understanding what their roles and responsibilities are, understanding if there's a nuance between EAP's process and the city's processes, we would like to know if there is a best practice already established within the city. Uh, we're going to be looking at identifying areas for further testing and further risk analysis, at which point we will start to collaborate, Doug and myself. This may just be all Doug, so I'm speaking on for him. <laughs> How does it feel? <laughs> um, a collaboration to identify um, areas of fraud. So in the analysis of the processes, um, in the past when I've conducted internal audits, I have stumbled onto fraud. It's never been something that I have been put on a project and said, hey, we've got fraud here, uncover it. That would just be not very productive. If you know there's fraud, then just get in that direction there. I've uncovered situations where there was fraud in accounts receivable and an individual was responsible for monthly cash reconciliations. The bank statements were fictitiously made by this individual, but when we requested the statements directly from the bank, we got the same statements that the individual had created. She'd given them to her bank friend to send them over to us. Something in the calculations were off, and we knew that these were both the same documents. It was not even the source. So going to yet another source, we were able to identify the real document. So sometimes it's requesting the same thing multiple times from multiple different people. We've had departments and clients that get quite irritated with that. They're like, they asked us that, and they asked me of that as well. Why are they asking of it twice? There's a rhyme and a reason for why we do these things, and that partly is to uncover different activities and to really get to the true source of documentation. So going through this process, we're identifying areas of further testing and identifying the full population and source of the documentation to know truly where we stop and start our audit testing. When we find findings is when we start to focus more into a targeted direction within that particular area, whether that's contracts, accounts payable, um, uh, looking at the authority process, we'll start focusing in more hours into those areas of highest risk or areas that we're seeing concerns. Um, our testing would then be communicated with you all. If we're seeing areas of concern or questionable activity, we would hopefully have that discussion with you sooner rather than later so that you're aware of what we're, uh, we're finding and hopefully there is a, a logical explanation as to that and we're not looking to jump the gun and start to, oh, what am I trying to say? We're not trying to make up a story, we're trying to find the facts that are supporting what the information is showing. So it's a fact-finding mission. It's a lot of work and a lot of hours, but it's something we're really passionate about. When myself, I, I feel like it was something I was born to do. That's why I've made my entire career around internal auditing. It's the nuggets in 
finding something like fraud or nefarious activities that keeps me excited and wanting to look at different projects from different angles. Um, I, I know that Doug thrives on that as well. Um, once the testing is completed, we've documented this. We've had your we've discussions with you guys, your input, your thoughts. We will then document that, put that into a report so that you have that documentation as well. We can provide that electronically in hard copy with all the supporting documentation that we've looked at so you have the support in the records that we're, you can go through and verify what we have found is accurate and complete. Did any other questions? Question? Do you want to do any follow-up? It wasn't my question, but you did fine with it. <laughs> it's just a question that's on a paper. Oh, okay. Um, I, so now's the time to ask any follow-up anyone would like of the five questions that we had circulated to, to ask of everyone. Would um, anyone like to kick us off with anything in particular? Councilmember Martinez? I just kind of have more of a general question. Um, how much uh, council and staff time do you think would, is required during a process like this? I, I hear that council, you'll update us regularly, so maybe we don't need to have any more um, time investments than just those um, check-ins and, and no, then the planning be, phase. You would be interviewed um, depending upon, I mean, we're looking to you for the guidance and the expectations that you have of us. You have an RFP, but you have your own direction that you want to give to the firms that you're going to hire. So we need that from you to enter any kind of relationship. And so one of the things that we would do is find out from you, okay, of this group, who should we interview? Who has the historical perspective, perhaps? Who has the um, in-depth knowledge of what's happened? Has there been one of you appointed as a liaison for EIF? Um, who is that person or persons? And we need to get to those people to be able to drill down to where we need to go. And we need to have your expectations. So it's not going to be a surface issue with the council. Um, we're going to need your guidance and we're going to need your continuous guidance and it may be that we come to a block that we can go down several different roads mm -hmm. we're going to have to come back to you to be able to get that direction so that may be at a, a council meeting that may be at a special meeting that may be at we're in the field come by and see us type of thing okay. so we expect to work with a liaison that will help us get to you okay great and then what about staff time our staff time? Our staff time. Your staff yeah. time. Yes. Well, you have three board members that are your staff mm -hmm. that sit on the EAF board. We will need access to those members, obviously, because they're board members. And they integrate with you as city, as the city. So depending upon how it's structured, we will also need to interview those people as well. Sure. And then somebody, if you decide that, you know the direction you want to go and let's say it's fraud and you want us to look at a five-year period of time because that's the expectation that you have that we're going to find or that's where the majority of the transactions occurred so focus on five years in the 20 years that this has been in existence and see what you can find I mean we're going to have to have somebody to gather the data for us so it's not only going to be those three board members from sure. EAF, but we're going to need some IT support to be able to say where is where is the data mm -hmm. can we get it all sure. is it electronic or is it paper right and do we have you know 20 boxes to go through those are things we're used to but that's going to take us some time to be able to say where is it how do we get to it right okay thank you mm -hmm. other questions council member sierra I'm trying to figure out how to word this question but since you do offer three different services if we were just uh, start off with an internal audit and I believe that you stated that you have done internal audits where you started noticing um, fraudulent activity is that something that you would come back to and say you know what we probably should start looking at at uh, fraud audit or if you notice that you know some of the issues with the internal audit may have been uh, in regards to process such as segregation of duties or something like that and then you suggest like an ICE that type of thing is that normally the process or what do other cities or other governments do when they start off with something like mm -hmm. 
typically in this situation, it's been my experience that we would forego an internal audit. We would go right into an ICE slash fraud forensics investigation, examination, audit. We'd be looking at it from that perspective. If we're looking, if you're thinking it's truly process and we just need to identify if the agency has followed the process as it's been documented, then that's an internal audit. And we're looking at a, a point in time. Yes, we can go back to inception and identify policies and procedures based on a certain date and look to see if activities follow those documented policies and procedures based on that date. Encapsulate that, move forward, identify the next iteration of policies and procedures, containerize that information and test it. Looking at processes, aggregation of duties and authority, we're going to be able to see where a process breaks down, look at where the gap is, and provide recommendations on how to close that gap going forward. When it comes to an ICE examination or fraud examination, we're going to be delving more specifically into an area that we feel that there has been activities that we want to further examine and be able to quantify. It could be a breakdown in a process. It could be an individual usurping their authority. It could be a whole host of things, but in order to identify that, we're going to look at it from a different perspective, and we're going to investigate it until we have the full picture. Thank you. Council Member Wink. Thanks, Mayor. Um, in terms of <coughs> understanding what the breadth of the research that you used to form some of your discussion items with us tonight, I'm curious to know, uh, the range of meetings that you watched of our council meetings. So which ones were the, the what did you watch? Um. Yes. Well, I'll just be honest with you. I've been interested in this for quite some time, a few years. Um, as I mentioned before, I was a director at Clifton Larson Allen, who is your external auditors. And as a director, my direct report at that time, I directly reported to Paul Niedermuller. So very familiar with the com component unit or foundation that's audited by CLA. Um, relationships with the former manager, Patrick, or Eric Keck, that was here as the former manager. So very familiar with the past issues that have happened with EIF and EMIRF and district attorneys getting involved and um, council members getting involved. So monitoring the study sessions has been something I've done joining I'd Bailey, something I was elated to see that there was a, pro a request for a proposal that came out through an RFP to have this looked at. It's been something ongoing that I've seen get to the surface and then kind of die away and then get to the surface again and die away. So it's, I can understand the, the evolution of the process and the, the behind the scenes that's going on. It takes some time to get momentum and get to where you're at. And I have just to reiterate, I've been interested for quite some time. I have monitored your study sessions, watched that. There's a lot of press on that. Um, here, it's neither here nor there. The truth is in the data. The truth is in the information that's there that nobody's looking at from an audit perspective. We know from our past and our experience that the data doesn't lie. The information is, is going to be there. We have enough manpower, mental power, as well as computer power to get through that information and give you the answers, I believe, that what you're looking for. And it's been answers you've been looking for for quite some time. Great. Thank you so much. If I could um, add on to that, Mayor. Uh, when, when I was brought into this uh, review of this proposal and reading it, um, being uh, a little different minded at times I could see that there was concerns and my background tells me when those concerns is there's other things going on so I also listened to the study session and read some of that and what I heard you folks uh, speaking of in regard was your concerns about transactions and stuff that probably weren't um, appropriate and to me that falls into my world in reference to being able to resolve any allegations that you have and to provide closure and to be able to give you the answers that you're looking for and to provide that assistance to you. So 
I wanted to make sure that when I read the RFP that I understood exactly what kind of the concepts were behind it, and that's the reason that I looked into your study sessions and read part of it. Anyone else? Councilmember Cuesta, I, I don't, your light isn't on, but I think, did you put it on? I thought I saw you flip it. Yeah, so. I did. Thank you. Um, if we were going comprehensively back to, I believe, when EAF was formed, which was 97, 98, I think, in that ballpark, I'm not sure what our records look like going back that far. Um, it, it just in uh, my own memory, I don't recall things being even close to uh, widespread digital at that point, so I'm sure you get a lot of paper records. I'm not sure if we know what we have, what is stored, what is not stored. What do you guys do when information gaps arise? It's going to sound like kind of an unusual answer, but it, it all depends. Um, sorry. It, it depends on what it is, whether if we can, uh, for instance, if we are missing uh, in invoices from, a, from a, a vendor, maybe we can go to the vendor and speak with them about getting it, copies of their invoices. Sometimes they keep better information. Sometimes we would come back and uh, suggest that you look at a different time frame that you look at a different area to be able to do that because of that. We do not want to guess at what took place, especially in a fraud exam. We want to tell you what took place. And if there's gaps, identify those gaps. And to be able to say that there is missing information here, and this is the reason that we couldn't give you that answer because the, the documentation just doesn't exist. Um, I have run into that many times in regards to it. Uh, we have spent, uh, my colleagues and I, we've spent hours inside storage rooms going through boxes, finding documents that were just mislabeled and put somewhere else that we were able to find the information. It, it all depends on the scope. If you wish to go back that far, we will do everything we can to help find that documentation and to give you suggestions on where to look for it, to be able to come up with uh, you know, additional documentation to be able to prove what you're looking for. And if it doesn't exist, you know, we're not going to make it up and, and give you information that's not true. Mayor Pro Tem Russell. Did you want to share? Yeah, I wanted to um, also respond to that. I believe that when we were doing our research, uh, we were provided with information that you could get back to uh, original documentation, that there were adjusting journal entries, that systems were in place. Um, you know, in the research we've done, we understand that in, uh, I believe this, I believe EF started in August of 1997. We do understand that there was an IRS ruling that EF was um, an actual exempt from taxes and a, and a governmental entity because it was so closely aligned with the city. So we understand that has taken place. We also have accounting standards in place that, that tell us and understand that EF is included inside of the city as a as a component unit. So, you know, there are, I'm not sure that everything exists, but from our research, it seems like there's quite a bit that exists, and until we get into the details, we wouldn't be able to know the gap there. So. Thank you. Um, my question is, there's been quite a bit of changeover in the directors of that board over the last um, uh, few years, and so there's not a whole lot of historical people still on staff in that position. Will those gaps be able to be filled in, and would you need to interview those people? I'm going to have to say um, there's a possibility, yes. If there is a hole that someone can fill and they're willing to talk to us, then we enjoy speaking with them to fill in that hole. If we're able to say that you have contracts or operating agreements, whatever you want to call it, that was in place during that time those people were there, we can go off of that and see if that answers all the questions we have. If it does not and there's someone that we can speak to that is willing to speak to us, on historically and talk to them, we would ask to speak with them and we would go to where they are and to make it as easy on them to speak with them, whether it's in their home, at a coffee shop, wherever they'd like to talk to, just to get that historical data. If there is that hole there that we can't prove or we can't shore up with documentation that you do have. Thank you. Council Member Barentine. That was a question I was gonna ask, so I appreciate that. That's, that's a very smart question, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, we have, in the, since we had a new city manager, there's something like 20 
directors that have come and gone in a very short period of time. A lot of institutional knowledge gone, a lot of the history. You have board members on there, I think at least two of the three have been there less than a year. So I'm not, it, it is very significant on whether that, how valuable, um, I'm, how much you're gonna garner from that and how much you're gonna have to go back and do in, in the additional work that would be in there. And I wanna make sure that I know that you made it very clear that you included going all the way back to the beginning, that that was very clear to you, because you did listen to the meetings, that was clear to you that that was something that was important. Um, but is that piece of it been you know, put into the, in, into the mix? And then the second piece of this is because you have had some experience with the city, do you think in any way that that would, um, uh, the way that you presented it was that it would be kind of advantageous to you, but do you think that there would be any downside to you guys doing that since you've worked with the city before? From an independence perspective, that's an excellent question. Thank you. As an internal auditor, we always need to be mindful of where our independence is. And I am independent of the city. I do not work for the city. I do not have ownership, stock, interest. I'm not involved in the city. I don't live in the city. I would hope I'm 100% independent in fact, mind and appearance. And that is my profession. I, I look at this as um, obviously we need to remove the shroud. We need to find the details and the information. Sometimes you're looking at it from a personal lens because you know your gut is telling you something and other times you remove yourself from your gut and you just truly are looking at the data. You're looking at the numbers in front of you. But there are times that, you know, personally you just know there's something there and you're gonna dig a little bit more. And, and maybe that's your, you know, your own personal involvement but I would say as a professional, I, I try to stay as independent as possible and just look at the information as truly independent. Um, I think I answered your question. Yeah, okay. And then for, to the question of whether, <clears throat> the question whether or not, uh, I think it's going to be additional work because you have people less than a year. I mean, most of them, probably don't have as much history because they're doing the work of what they're trying to do. Has that been included in the price already as an understanding that there may be some additional work that you need to do if you have to go outside of current employees? You know, one of the things that we did as a group is discuss that because we don't want to, and we aren't the type of firm that's going to come in and say, oh, it's going to cost you three times this. Uh, we believe that we did adequate research to go back and ask questions about how much data is there if it's 100% fraud. Now, we don't know the exact, but we did ask that question. We did get answers, and we did price our proposal with the range, not knowing what we might encounter from a standpoint of the <clears throat> historical intelligence that you're talking about, we do understand that you've had turnover. Audrey has had a connection here that has turned over. So we understand those things that are going on. Obviously in this, this time frame, you've got baby boomers retiring at record numbers. So those things are, are normal for us. And again, looking at the data is where we will need to be as long as we can get to that data. Yes, would it be nice to talk with someone who was here during that period of time? Sure. But if the data is available, the data will speak to us. If it's not, we will come back to you with that, those pieces of gaps of information and figure out where to go from there. But um, if people are willing to talk to us, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Doug and I are going through an engagement right now where we'd like to talk with someone that um, is in one of our governments that had left and they won't talk to us. That's okay, the data is there. Would it be nice? Sure, but the data is what speaks to us. Thank, Thank you. you. I have a couple of questions and I know we're running out of time, but the first one is um, what do you think, given what you've heard, what you've seen and what you've read and the articles and so forth, um, what do you think will be the most challenging about this particular work for you? I think the most challenging thing for us will be for uh, you to come up with what you would like for us to do. Um, 
that is just factual. You are um, in a position where you know so much more about this engagement than we do, uh, but you've got to come up with a decision on how you want to proceed. So hiring the firm that you want to take you to that level is going to be your first uh, expectation or your first goal. And then, based on what you hear tonight, who do you think will get you to a point where you want to be? What are the questions that you want to have answered? That's the challenge for us. We hear certain things, but we've got to meet your expectations if you hire us. So you've got to come up with the questions you want us to answer. We can help you with that based on what we've heard, but we can go down three different avenues. We need to determine, and we can collaborate on that, how we're going to get to what you want us to answer. That's going to be the challenge. Let's say that you're correct in, in that, um, I believe you said the internal controls examination and fraud, right? Is that really the two areas? Without the internal piece, seems like it's not as important, but perhaps you'll uncover something there where you'll have to do more, I don't know. Um, let's say that's it. Mm -hmm. So how would we make you more successful in approaching those? I think the planning phase, the phase one of being available to us to interview, to get the ball rolling in the expectation to, to target the areas of internal controls that you want us to focus on. And again, we can collaborate on that. We've heard contracts, accounts payable, approval process. So we've heard lots of things and we can help you from an accounting standpoint, figure out what lane to get in if we're doing an ICE engagement so that we can figure out where the breakdowns are and what we see. And then from there, if there are issues, go right into a fraud engagement. Thank you. I think our, our next little piece is to talk about next steps. If we were to uh, decide to do this with you, what would you want next from us? We would want to get together with you, meet, get an engagement letter, contract, figure out what lane we're going to be in. Are we going to do ICE and forensics? Are we going to start out with ICE? If there are issues, we're going to go into forensics. We can structure our contract engagement letter. You have contractual legal beagles that you have to deal with to enter those. We deal with that every day. So we would need to target what we're going to do. And we could target all three and determine that this is where we're going to go. But our first priority is ICE. Our second priority is fraud. And then you may want to hire us later on, years down the pike, for the city to do internal audit. I mean, we do that with many of our clients after you see what we can do. So that would be the first thing, is to get the contract in place with how you want that to read, and then we would begin to perform our planning process immediately once that contract is signed and we work through that with you, and then we would begin the planning process of sitting down, figuring out who we're gonna interview, setting up schedules, who we're gonna go through from a liaison standpoint and go through phase one, two, three, and four. Thank you, I think that was pretty clear. I, thank you for your time. I think you've been very um, complete in your answers and appreciate it. Yeah. We appreciate it. And if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to reach out. We do have a uh, leave behind of what we, what we just did uh, from a standpoint of the presentation that's on the board and then also some information just about ICE, internal audit, fraud. Great. Thank you. So the PowerPoint is actually in a hard copy in this? Yes. Right okay, right. great. That's Thank you. Thank you, and Council, I've asked that she send the, the electronic formats to this so that we can put it out in the public, okay? Thank you. Thank you. 
Delta, if you want to take a bit of a stretch break, <laughs> a few minutes, just up, around, whatever you need. But we'll start in about, well, in a few minutes, three minutes. Thank you. Maybe after the next one? All right, we have one taking a bio break, so anyone else who needs to do the same, let's all do that because then we'll save some time. Anybody else need to go? I need to go. I will too. I will too. <laughs> Sorry, we're all drinking too much water. And getting tired. <laughs> it's good to do in Colorado. Uh, Get mine out here. It's a small world in the consulting business. We, we knew all three of them, or I, I did at least, and you knew one of them. a lot of, if, if you've seen our presentation, a lot of the five questions in our presentation, but then they'll, yeah. Well, it's nice that we're finally here. <laughs> what was it, two postponements? I know we had the blizzard the once. <laughs> Did we have to postpone it a second time, or was it just that one? Oh, schedule, okay, yeah, that's right. So now when this live streams, does it show us and the presentation at once? I forget, because I've watched some of the live streams, but I don't remember. <laughs> Okay, just curious. Also, are we the last firm? To the one more. City of Aspen for um, presentation. Oh, oh, okay. I think we're all back. Thank you uh, for being here tonight, and I'm going to let Director Sabata introduce you, and uh, and then we'll go around and introduce. Or should we go around first? Maybe we'll go around first. Anyway. Council Member Sierra, do you want to start? We'll introduce ourselves to you, and then you, and it's your show. Good evening, Othaniel Sierra, uh, District One. All 
Laura Barentine, District 3. Linda Olson, District 2 and Mayor. Rita Russell at large and Mayor Pro Tem. Good evening, Dave Cuesta, District 4. Uh, Cheryl Wink, <laughs> I'm an at, ar at large member. Amy Martinez, Council Member at Large. And I'm John Ollenberger with CICN. And I'm Larry Hall, Independent Consultant working with CICN. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to the Colorado Independent Consultants Network. Um, this um, is the second firm um, interview session tonight. We'll go about 50 minutes again with a 15 minute introduction and presentation, a 30 minute Q&A, and a five minute next steps discussion. Great, and, and if you can speak right into these, um, that will help with the people who might be listening at home. We do have people that watch the live streaming, so thank you. Sure. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, I know it's, we've been trying to come here for <laughs> a while now, I think, with the blizzard last time, and uh, so glad to finally be here. Uh, we are CICN, Colorado Independent Consultants Network. Um, I put up a couple of slides there from the old Cinderella City Mall. I thought it was just kind of interesting when I was doing the research for it. Uh, it was quite the thing back in its day. And uh, so I think we have uh, one of the entrance and then Cinder Alley. <laughs> so I, I kind of want to walk through it. <laughs> but should have been here. <laughs> yeah, it should have been here about 30 years ago probably. Uh, so let's see. What we have on here, we have uh, incorporated your five questions into our presentation, and obviously uh, you guys can ask as many questions as you want afterwards. Um, but we'll go through things. So we're going to introduce Larry and myself. We'll talk about our team members that we had on the proposal who are not here with us tonight. Um, and we'll, Larry and I will give you a little bit of our background, uh, talk about our understanding of what it is that you guys are looking for. Uh, similar audits that we've done for other uh, cities, uh, towns, municipalities, counties. Uh, our qualifications of our staff. We'll talk a little bit about the cost and the timeline of uh, what we proposed. Talk about our audit process, uh, how we intend to go about looking at things, and then open it up to questions. So with that, uh, as I mentioned, my name is John Olenberger. Uh, I started my career off in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, with Arthur Anderson, uh, who I'm sure all of you have probably heard of. Uh, started off in external audit, so I did financial statement attestation work. Uh, was there in um, external audit for a couple of years, and then switched over in, into internal audit, and I really enjoyed that, and that it incorporated, there was still some financial aspects to internal audit, but incorporated a lot more of the business processes, and a lot more uh, of the organization than just the financial component of it. We'd be looking at operational processes, <coughs> HR, um, purchasing is always a big, a big one. Uh, after that, I went to waste management, and I was in their internal audit practice for three years, and then took a position at uh, KPMG with their leadership team uh, on their management team. Was at KPMG for three years, and broke off to start CICN 11 years ago today. And the reason I say that, as uh, I've been getting flooded with LinkedIn messages saying congratulations, and I'm like, oh, I didn't even realize it was today. But uh, so we've been in business for over a decade, and. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about our firm uh, in upcoming slides, and I'm going to let Larry talk about his uh, background and experience. Okay. So I'm Larry Hall. I have uh, over 30 years' experience. Uh, I've been an executive level in auditing and accounting. Uh, I was a CAE, or Chief Audit Executive, for 18 years with three different companies. I also was a uh, vice president and controller for a large transportation company. And I've worked in primarily industry, except for the last 10 years now, uh, as of April 9th. Uh, I've been on my own, and uh, so I've worked a lot with John on other projects. I've worked in county government, quasi-government uh, entities. I've worked in government contracting, uh, construction. These are just some of the industries I've been in. Entertainment, retail, food, beverage, concessions, transportation, manufacturing, uh, sports, communications, energy, and service industry. So a long career, uh, a lot of it in internal audit, actually most of it internal audit, so 30 years in internal audit. That's me. Great. 
Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the term CIA, it's uh, Certified Internal Auditor. It's a certification. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with CPA, Certified Public Accountant. So when you see uh, some of those up there, and then uh, Larry also has the CFE, Certified Fraud Examiner uh, designation up there. And I think that covers all the, the ones that you might not be aware of. Some of the other members of our team, Angelica Grieber, uh, she is a Certified Public Accountant uh, with 12 years of detailed accounting experience. And she was a key participant on our City of Aspen cash reconciliation uh, redesign work that we did for that city uh, last year. Uh, Ron Hilsenhoff, he's a certified internal auditor. He has uh, almost 30 years of experience. He is also a former chief audit executive, and he was a key participant on our Jefferson County purchasing, uh, purchasing card reviews, as well as other Jefferson County work that we've done. Chris Horton is also a uh, certified internal auditor. He has over 17 years of experience. He has his PhD in public administration. And uh, he also has experience with the city of Denver and the city of Arlington, Virginia's uh, auditor's offices. So a lot of experience there. Kelly Bronce, uh, she is a certified public accountant, has over 16 years of experience, uh, much like me, both with financial statement attestation work, uh, as well as internal audit. And she was a key participant on a, a lot of our Adams County uh, internal audit work that we did. So that is us. A little bit about our firm here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 11 years today, so we've been in existence for over a decade. I think that is uh, something to be said for small businesses starting up, and it shows that we have the, uh, we're going to be around. We're not just a new firm that's been around for a couple of years. We're, we're here to stay. Uh, a couple of the things I want to point out, the exclusive or near exclusive focus in local government. I think that's important when you are a local government looking for work that that's almost all of our experiences in local government. Um, in addition to that, our firm is also exclusively focused in internal audit, which is different from external audit. Uh, as you know, you have an external audit financial statement auditor, uh, but this is a lot more process driven, a lot more focused on processes and forensic uh, accounting more so than attestation work. Um, and our focus is in business process improvement. So it's, we're a boutique firm that has that exclusive focus. Uh, we're also a local firm that uses local resources. So um, in our proposal, you saw that uh, out-of-pocket expenses were very minimal. Um, that's because we're using all local resources and we can be here in person to provide meetings like this for you guys, update meetings. Uh, everything's gonna be in person, which I think is important. I always prefer the face-to-face -face whenever possible. Um, also, just uh, to point out that we're experienced in public sector report writing and we know who our audience is. It's not just gonna be management as it might be in a lot of corporations, it's gonna be the public most likely. It's gonna be up to you. We don't release any of our reports. Uh, the default is we keep them confidential and it's just between us and the organization. However, in municipalities, uh, most of that is public record anyway and it's a lot of our uh, public sector clients decide to release that to the public just out of spirit of transparency. So we make sure that our reports are written for a public audience. We want to say what the issues are that we find, but we want to do so in a way that doesn't generate a lot of press interest uh, just for the sake of, um, you know, we, we just want to improve the process. That's what our primary goal is here. Also being a, um, just one more thing I wanted to add on that last slide, being an internal audit specialty firm, if, you, if the city does choose to do additional internal audit work after this, you could stay with the same firm with that internal audit specialty as opposed to a firm that might uh, staff it with forensic people and then you'd have work, be working with a different team if you decided to do internal audit work in the future. So just something, if that's a consideration at all. Uh, our understanding of the audit, so we understand that the Englewood Environmental Foundation, or EEF, was created in 1997 uh, to oversee the Cinderella City Mall redevelopment. Um, taking a look at the financials, I took a look at the 2017 CAFR, um, and it looks like the major expenses of the EEF are maintenance type stuff. Um, maintaining the existing infrastructure that's here, uh, snow removal, that kind of stuff. Um, the board is made up of three departments within the city of Englewood, Public Works, Community Development, and Finance. Uh, I've seen a bunch of articles, uh, mainly in the local uh, press here about the EEF and some of the allegations towards it. So I understand that that's one of the major focuses of uh, this council is to address those allegations and put it to bed, just be done with it. Um, 
and so that, that's what we have as our primary focus of this, um, which uh, when we looked at the RFP, it looked like it was process improvement and a forensic uh, evaluation, but taking another look at the allegations that are out there, we think the primary focus is probably the forensic, uh, the forensic work and then the secondary focus being to improve the controls, which we will do as part of the forensic work. We understand what the processes are. We try to shoot holes in them and say what could go wrong with this process. How could someone get away with something? How could something be recorded um, unintentionally? And then we make recommendations on how to improve that process. So those are the two focuses that we have there. Some of the other things that we had under the allegations, there was an April 2017 district attorney's report. Uh, they determined that it, they were not going to pursue it for, from a criminal aspect. It's not the same as saying that everything's fine, there's no issues here. It's not a clearing of the EEF, it's just saying that we didn't find enough to move forward on it and we're not going to move forward there. That was our understanding of that. We didn't get too far into any of these, but just looking at what's going on here. As part of our audit, we would go into further detail. We would interview people. We would say, what, is the, what are the concerns of the council? Uh, that's one of the things we want to do is involve you guys to the extent that you want to be involved, involve the city management to the extent that they want to be involved to really understand what the issues are and focus our audit based on that. Um, some of the other allegations. Uh, now this next one, is, it isn't really an allegation. The EEF isn't subject to city policies. That's just the way it is. Uh, but we'd look at what, what the EEF's policies are and see if they follow their own policies and see if those policies are appropriate. The first thing we do is we look at a process and say, or a policy and say, is this a good policy? If so, let's test it and see if people were compliant with it. If not, let's make recommendations to improve the policy. A um, couple other allegations, uh, we have city official gave work to friends in exchange for kickbacks, overpayment for services, embezzlement, corruption, illegal contracts. These are just things from reading the press. We're not saying that this is happening. This is just things that we would put on our list. So as we're going through the forensic work, let's keep this in mind and let's test uh, to make sure that we address all these allegations and that we can put this to bed once and for all. So in terms of the similar audits that we've done uh, to this, I put, I focused a lot on uh, purchasing, since we're looking at purchases, um, and then also on some fraud investigations, since there's the forensic component of this as well. So the first one, Jefferson County, this is actually two different audits. Uh, the purchasing uh, was one audit, and then several years later, they had us come back and do a P-card audit. Um, the purchasing audit was probably more comprehensive than what you guys are looking for here. Uh, Taking also doing some benchmarking in terms of other counties to say what uh, how many people do they have in their purchasing what are the different approval thresholds we have all that information we can incorporate it but it was a little bit more involved there the P card audit was uh, a lot of the same in terms of the forensic work that we'd be doing taking a sample of uh, transactions there we looked at a hundred here we're proposing looking at a hundred transactions um, and looking at each one of them develop the attribute testing where we say okay for each transaction was it properly approved? Was it something that the city actually, or that the county actually needed? Um, did they go out to bid if they had to? Did they have evidence of what they got for the bids? Did they retain that? Does it make sense who they chose and why they chose that person for each transaction? Uh, the Adams County Purchasing Study, this was done after the Jefferson County, and this was a very in-depth one. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the Adams County issues that they had, primarily paving roads that didn't exist, so there was a fraud component there as well. And because of that, that was our first audit right out of the bat. It was actually done separate as a separate scope from the internal audit work. We were also their internal audit firm for a while. Uh, but the purchasing study was done separately. It was a uh, pretty in-depth where we looked at a lot of transactions, both purchasing and P-card. We looked at their policies. We later helped them rewrite their purchasing policies. Uh, so was a lot of work in terms of purchasing done for Adams County. Garfield County purchasing audit. And another thing I'd like to point out here is the scope of work on this from fairly small, which is Garfield County, that was a, a fairly small engagement. We were focused on uh, purchases made by their facilities department and whether those purchases were appropriate or not and actually necessary. And some of the same things that the city's looking for here, uh, did it go out to bid if it needed to be? Uh, did we have evidence as to why we chose the vendor that we chose for it? 
and did we get the work out of it that we were expecting to get? That was a relatively small one. The Adams County one was a huge one, and it, that one was actually a three-year effort. We did an initial study, and then we did two follow-up years thereafter. Um, so we have experience doing very small and very large purchasing studies. Uh, the next one, City of Aspen fraud investigation. Uh, this was a fun one. Is, uh, I don't know if anyone heard about this. People would get a debit card from uh, King Supers or City Market up in the City of Aspen. They would go out to restaurants, go spend it, just a $25 card. Then they'd go get uh, parking for the City of Aspen. It's $28 a day. They're very proud of their parking there. Uh, and the debit card would have no value on it because it would all be expended. They'd get their value worth out of that. Stick it in the parking machine, say I'll take one day of uh, parking, and the parking machine would spit out a receipt saying, okay, put this in your windshield, you're good to go. The next day, the parking machine would send those transactions to the processing agent that would reject them and say there's insufficient funds on this card. They'd charge the city for putting a transaction through that had no funds, and the city would, would lose out on the parking revenue, and they'd be charged a fee for it. So we came in after the fact, after that was discovered, to quantify that loss uh, of the city. And then while we were in there, the city also wanted us to look at cash receipts processes for pretty much any entity within the city that received cash uh, to make sure that they had good processes in place for that. So I thought that was kind of an interesting one. And then, as I mentioned before, we've done other work for the city of Aspen since. Uh, city of Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, we've done We've completed a risk assessment, an entity-wide entity risk assessment where we look at everything within the city, fire, police, public works, the airport. Uh, we have a pretty intensive interview session where we talk to them about everything that they, um, everything that goes on in the city, what the risks are, we rank all the risks, and then we formulate an internal audit plan from that. One of the things we do on each internal audit, and we do here, is a audit level risk assessment, and we pointed this out in our uh, proposal where we would say, all right, we're going to look at EEF's purchasing. What are the risks to EEF purchasing? Let's write those down and let's focus our audit on what those risks are uh, to make sure that we're looking at the important areas. There might be lesser important areas with a limited amount of time. I don't know of any entity that has unlimited time and budget, so you want to focus on where the high risk areas are and we can do that with our risk assessment process on an audit level basis. Currently with the City of Santa Fe, we're in the midst of a purchasing audit, almost identical to what we'd be doing here. Uh, also looking at their purchasing policies and processes. Uh, that one we're going in a little bit more detail where we are soliciting feedback from all the major buyers within the city to get their opinion on what they think of the purchasing process. That's probably going to be a lot more than we would do in this case because the EEF has four people on, on its uh, the board for it, whereas the city of Santa Fe and the city of Englewood too would have a lot more people that would use the overall purchasing function as opposed to the EEF. But just to say we are in the midst of another one currently. Uh, in terms of a couple additional fraud ones, Santa Clara Valley Water District, we've been doing work for them lately uh, on construction and conflict of interest, uh, which may or may not be issues with EEF if they're allegations. We have recent experience doing that. And the waste management fraud investigation, this is another one of my favorites. Uh, I, you probably haven't heard of this, but this was also in um, uh, San Jose, California. Uh, there were 13 people working in a landfill, and I believe 10 of them were all colluding on this fraud where uh, garbage trucks would come up and instead of paying waste management, the organization, they would pay uh, a third party broker who would give them kickbacks uh, to the tune of about $300,000. Now a scale, scale house attendant in a landfill makes about thirty grand. and it usually doesn't have a high school diploma um, and these people are making $300,000 a year and our client was um, being defrauded out of $13 million that we quantified. So uh, a lot of fraud experience. We're going to let Larry give another couple of examples of uh, similar audits that we've done. All right, so uh, I just listed about six of them here that uh, have some applicability, I think, to this project and to some of the allegations or things that have been made uh, known to us. So the first one is about a consultant uh, billing. Uh, this was a very large project for a communication company. Um, there were uh, a lot of staff hours that were rebilled on numerous invoices going on for about three years. Um, so these were not duplicate billings, these were duplicate charges. So it would be like 
CICN billing you in January for certain hours that I work, say for example, and in August billing you again for those same hours. Um, very, uh, so it was expensive, uh, it was significant overcharges and all the money was recovered and of course the consultant was fired. So, uh, in a, another one was an in-house uh, real estate manager receiving kickbacks. Uh, from listing agents, uh, we had a lot of properties, uh, I would say over 100 that we were trying to sell. Uh, he was arranging all of the uh, brokers, and then when they would sell it, they would pay him a commission in addition to us paying him a commission. I, I don't want to stop if you want to keep doing this, um, but we're at 7.25 and I want to li leave time for the questions. So oh, it's up to you if you want to tell us more Whatever examples. We, we can move on, and if you want to, want to hear more of the examples, we, okay. can, we have more to share. Great, thanks. Because uh, we do want to allow plenty of time for you guys to answer to ask additional questions. Staff qualifications, uh, I'm not going to read through all of these. These are all in our proposal. But uh, basically, our highlights here is that we only use highly experienced professionals. We don't have and we don't use entry-level staff. So uh, it's not like we put our partners and managers in the proposal, and then you get someone that's two years out of college that shows up to actually do the work. You're going to have people that are at the partner manager level actually doing the work uh, with you. And then we also have bench strength, so if we need additional people on, uh, we have about 30 professionals in our network that we can bring on uh, as needed if we need additional people in addition to the people that we already put into our proposal. Talking a little bit about the audit cost and the timeline, uh, the cost is in the proposal. It is all inclusive. The city has asked for a firm fixed price, and that's what we provided. Uh, there's no administrative charges. There's no overhead charges in there. 99% um, when I was putting this presentation together I looked at it 99% of the cost is the professional service fees uh, there's not c charges for travel hotels cars anything like that so I think that's important to note as well um, and also being local the, the majority of the work would be performed on site where we could talk to the individuals in charge of things ask questions face to face and again uh, it's my personal belief that that's the best way to conduct an audit um, in terms of the timeline, uh, as you know, we've been trying to, <laughs> to get a decision made on this and it's been pushed back uh, several times. Looking at the hours that we have proposed and allowing for time for documentation to be pulled, time for management to respond to uh, our draft audit report. Uh, we think it's probably about a four month time frame from initial kickoff to the final report issuance. Uh, we're not sure when the decision making process is going to happen on the city's end, but I'm thinking that uh, a targeted completion date by the end of September would probably be realistic given um, circumstances and time frames. In terms of our audit process, uh, we have uh, a component in our budget, and we do provide a detailed budget so you can see everything that we're planning on doing, uh, to involve data analytics, and that's taking a look at the data set as a whole. So all 6,000 or so transactions, it looks like there's a total population of 6,500. We'd look through that for anything unusual that pops out, uh, duplicate transactions, uh, vendors that seem odd that we wouldn't expect for what EEF does. Uh, that type of thing we do on a population-wide basis, and that will give a certain degree of comfort that things are either okay or not okay. Um, if we did, if we were to do a judgmental sample, we would use that analysis to say, here's some things that we know we want to look at. Because they seem off, maybe it looks duplicate, um, it's a large dollar amount, we do a pivot table on vendors and we see total vendor spend and we just want to focus on these. Uh, maybe it's an even dollar amount and it looks like it could potentially be a payoff that we might be interested in. Those are the types of things we do with our data analytics. Um, with what the city was originally asking for, I believe they wanted to look at every transaction. But with 6,500 transactions, I don't believe that's feasible. Let me rephrase, it is feasible to look at every single transaction. I wouldn't recommend it, and I don't think you'd want to do that. We did bid on something once where they insisted that they wanted every transaction looked at, and the bid was about a half million dollars. Um, you need to pull physical documentation and actually look at the documentation in order to get something out of it. Uh, data analytics we can get certain things out of, but we can't uh, 
if the approval is hard copy on the thing, we can't tell if it's approved or not. Uh, usually you can't tell if it went out to bid just based on look at data analytics. You actually need to pull physical files, whether they be electronic or paper-based, and actually look at them. So what we're proposing is kind of the happy medium between judgmental sampling and the entire population, and let's look at a statistically valid sample of 100. So that is statistically valid. I ran it through a, a sample size calculator. Um, it's a 95% confidence level and a confidence interval, interval of 10. Um, and then we can also put in certain restrictions at the city's pleasure uh, for certain things that you might want to be interested in. Any restrictions that we put in place would obviously affect our statistical analysis at the end. One thing that we did for Jefferson County is we said, we're not going to look at any transaction under $100. Um, so when we look at our results at the end, we can only project anything that's over $100. But you might not want us randomly pulling a $2.50 transaction. You might want us to focus on the higher ones, so we can do that. Um, we also, we have our attributes that we test for normally. We look at what the risks are and we design our testing around those to test for those. Uh, one of the, some of the main ones are, as I mentioned before, is it properly approved? Is it an appropriate transaction? Was it competitively bid? Uh, did it follow the purchasing guidelines, whatever they were applicable at the time? And that could have changed over the years. Um, but we can talk to whoever's interested in having input into our process and involve you guys to say, what are you really concerned about? And let's make sure that we test for that when we look at things. Um, and then another big thing of our firm is to have regular status update meetings where we inform you as to what we've done so far, what we found so far as a potential finding, let's talk about it. Maybe it's an issue, maybe it's not, but let's talk through it. Um, and where we're going and if we need to change gears at all, because you might say, you know what, this is great so far, but we were really hoping you'd look at this uh, so we can change gears on the fly as needed to. Um, at the end, we do recommendations on policy and procedure improvement. So we'll look at your, mainly your current proce uh, policies and procedures. I don't know to the extent that it's changed over the years. Um, but generally, when we do work, we don't look at policies that were 10 years old and say, how could they improve policies that were 10 years old? We look at the policies that are in place as of the current day and say, how can we improve these on a go-forward basis? And then at the end, you'd receive a written report with our Final conclusions, our reports typically have issue, risk, recommendation. So issue, what's the problem? Risk, why do we care? Why should we change it? Recommendation, what is our recommendation to fix this going forward? Um, and then a management response, which is a response from the city saying, this is our response to your recommendation CICN. Either we accept it or we disagree. Uh, usually if it's a disagreement, we'll work with the city to see is it something we missed or is it just a disagreement. We don't have too many of those. Um, and we'll open it up to questions. Great, thank you. Uh, for the sake of time and looking at the questions that we have five questions that we were gonna that we are going to ask. And so uh, what I'll do is I think I'll start Mayor Pro Tem with you on these. And uh, why don't we start by um, suggesting if there's anything more on that question. If you think they've answered it already, I don't want to you know, make you go over every single one of them. And then if you have a different question you want to ask, why don't you throw that in then so we can make it around. Does that okay. make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, the first question is describe your understanding of the audit. Um, and I know you've done that some. Um, so. Yes. Uh, well, as our, our understanding uh, that we had is that there's allegations uh, about the EEF and things that went wrong and things, um, the allegations that we mentioned up there. Um, and there's talk about is this a forensic audit versus is this a performance audit. We don't really categorize forensic versus performance. We look at an, aud an internal audit as an internal audit and an internal audit has um, forensic components to it if it needs to be. Uh, we're going to look at the transactions for things that would, that you might consider a forensic audit. We're going to say for all the things that we mentioned up there that we'd look for and anything that we didn't put up there that you guys are interested in say, I really want to know X. Well, let's talk about that. Is that something that we can evaluate on a per transaction level basis and give you that answer? Can we build that in? And if we can't give you that answer, why can't we? And let's explain that and see if we can work on something there. Uh, but it's our understanding that there's 6,500 transactions. Uh, you want a firm to come in and look at 
those transactions, whether it be all of the transactions or a subset of the transactions, and determine if they were appropriate for the attributes that I mentioned. Does that, uh, was there further questions that you had on our understanding? No, that answered it, and you pretty much summarized it, so okay. thank you. Councilmember Cuesta. Sure. Uh, I'm going to read the second question, although I believe you guys have uh, addressed it extensively. Please describe in detail similar audits that you have conducted. Uh, I believe you gave a fair amount of examples uh, going through in the beginning. So if you don't mind, I I'll ask a, a question that I had of my own. I thought might not even <laughs> sure. um, We have more. <laughs> yeah. so, um, How long do you guys have? <laughs> uh, the 6,500 figure transactions, was that part of the RFP? That, that was, was part of the RFP. That w I think we asked that question, actually. Other firms may have asked it as well, uh, because I think the original request was, I want to say it was audit all of the transactions. Uh, and again, it's possible. I'm pretty sure you guys don't want to do that. Um, but that's why I thought a statistical, va statistically valid sample would be a get you guys what you need. I understand you guys want closure. You want to be able to tell your constituents that, uh, yes, we had a firm come in, they did a statistically valid sample, and here are the conclusions. Um, we may have problems with the sample. Some of it's going to be how good is, are your records. We're talking about going back, uh, was it 20 years? 22. Yeah. 22 years. Um, most of our clients don't have documentation going back 22 years. We will go back as far as we are able to go back with what we have in terms of documentation. But once you go back, and we can still do data analytics. If you have the transactions that go back 22 years, we can do data analytics back as far as you have the transaction listing and see if we have anything unusual. In terms of looking at a specific transaction to say, OK, we uh, spent a uh, million dollars on Joe's snow removal back in the year 2000. Well, unless you have that bid documentation, if it went out to bid, uh, we're probably not even going to know if it went out to bid and if it was a fair process at that time. And we would articulate that in our report and say these are the limitations of our scope. Uh, so to that note, you used the number 100 for your sample size. Was that an example or is that, uh, that, is our is proposal. that how you understood? Thank you. Based on Thank a you statistically are. valid sample. Very good. Thank you. And I, I don't know how many of you have been involved in statistically valid sample sizes, but I believe that 100 is a fairly common number when it comes to statistically valid sampling. If you have 6,500 transactions, I think if you have uh, 16,000 transactions, there becomes a limit where 100 gets to be about the statistically valid sample size. I want to say it was actually 97 or 98, and I think we rounded to 100. Councilmember Wink. Thank you, Mayor. My question is about the qualifications of your staff members, so I'll go ahead and ask my own questions. I have four quick questions. Um, one, if we go back to the slide on similar audits that you spoke to, there we are. Uh, what quickly are the time frames for these? How long did each one take? No, when in time. Sure. So 20 years ago, last year. <laughs> could I right just now? ask that we hold off on that, because that's number four, the timeline. Oh, okay, you're asking. I'm <laughs> sorry, I thought you were asking the timeline of this. Sure. So uh, Jefferson, Jefferson yeah. County uh, was the purchasing audit, and I'm taking a good, that was maybe five years ago. The okay. P-card audit was probably two years ago. Uh, we have done work, and we continue to do work with Jefferson County. We most recently did a, um, uh, what was the name? ACCA. Uh, the emergency communications uh, department at Jefferson County. Before that, we did a fuel usage mm -hmm. study, and we currently have a master services agreement with the county. So they are an ongoing client. Um, I just highlighted the ones that were relevant to this sure. audit. The Adams County purchasing study, that was in 2012. Garfield County was uh, 2012, 13, and 14. Garfield County was uh, probably three years ago. City of Aspen fraud investigation, uh, I believe that was five years ago. And then our most recent work with City of Aspen was back, uh, we concluded that in October of 2018. Uh, the City of Santa Fe, New Mexico, the risk assessment was October of 2018. The purchasing study is current. Uh, it, we started that last month. Uh, the Santa Clara Valley Water District, that is ongoing. We started that in 2018. And the waste management fraud investigation, that was from uh, the beginning of CICN back okay. in 20... Um, yeah, you were still in the East Coast. 10, I right. think. 
Uh, no, I was here. Oh, good. Okay. It was here in Colorado. Oh, very good. I mean, I, I was based in Colorado. The audit took place in California. Okay. Thank you. And then in addition to that, we have other stuff that is current and of more course. recent. We just highlighted the ones that These are These are more relevant, relevant to yeah. us. Thank you so much. Um, um, are you available to represent us? Should litigation activities be deemed needed after your work, your assessment? I'm gonna have, have you done representation? Do you do that? Uh, we, we don't typically. Nope. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, how regular are the regular meetings that you cited a, a few minutes ago? It depends on how long the audit is. Generally, once every two weeks. What do you mean, how long? So you uh, put sorry, that it would end in uh, September, end of September, right? Is what the slide said. Is that what you mean? I, I think I might have uh, misunder uh, misinterpreted your question. I, I thought you were asking how frequent we update, do a status update meeting during yeah. an audit, mm -hmm. about every two weeks. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Do either of you have existing relationships with Englewood employees or previous employees in Englewood? I do not. I do not. And as, as to the best, very best of my knowledge, none of our staff does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My question, I believe you already answered, which is uh, review the details of audit cost and timeline. Uh, but can you remind me of the cost of our proposal? I want to say it was uh, it was under forty thousand. I want to say it was around thirty six. Yeah, I just don't have the number right in front of me. Thirty six four twenty. And, and one clarification on that, uh, we did provide a detailed budget on that that says exactly what our assumptions are. And one of the big assumptions in there is the testing of 100 transactions. If the council would like to change that, if they want us to look at all of them, if they want us to look at 200 of them, that could affect it. But other than that, is a firm fixed price. Thank you. Council Member uh, Sierra. Yeah, thank you. Uh, could you go into a little bit more de detail about the process itself? Uh, for internal audit, and um, I know that you don't classify internal versus forensic, but any differences be the, between the two that you would see, or how you would go about in identifying one versus the other? Sure. Well, when we typically do internal audits, we, we look at what the client is asking for, and in this case, it seems to us, it's our impression that the primary concern here is looking at transactions to determine if there is any wrongdoing, to determine if the EEF followed their own policies on this, and if we de determine that there's any wrongdoing there. Uh, that's, that is a little bit of a different scope than a traditional internal audit, so I guess in, in terms of a differentiation between internal audit and a forensic audit, it, it's leaning on the forensic side because we're looking at a specific list of transactions. You guys want us to go back basically to the um, inception of the EEF or as far back as we can. During a traditional internal audit, we typically go back one year. In a traditional internal audit, we're generally looking at how do we improve the organization's internal controls. And so we're, we, all, we look at any fraudulent activity that there might have been over the past year. In an internal audit, we would typically do a judgmental sample where we do data analytics on a data set and we'd say, we're interested in these transactions. Why are you going to Best Buy? Why are you giving uh, Joe's Plumbing checks of $1,000 every month. Um, things like that that come up that just stick out to us as of interest. In the forensic audit, if you want to come to a conclusion about uh, the data set as a whole, really you need to do a statistically valid sample in order to be able to project that to the population. So if we found in our statistically valid sample of 100 that say 50 of them should have been put out to bid, and 25 of them were put out to bid. Then we could extrapolate that over the population and say, because it was a statistically valid, here's what the result would be for the entire population within those constraints, 95% confidence level, 10 confidence interval. Um, internal audit, again, using the judgmental sample, we're more, more focused on the process and say, let's look at a sample. Usually it's a smaller sample. It might be 25 or 30 in an internal audit. Um, and usually we find stuff within 25 or 30 testing uh, transactions that went wrong within the most recent year. So it's, it's, the thought is that you're looking at your current processes. This is the way we do things now. How are you doing things now? Could those use improvement? Not how did you do things 20 years ago, but how are you doing them right now? That would be internal audit. Forensic audit would be, let's go back and really try to find where there was wrongdoing, if there was wrongdoing. This is gonna have a little bit of flavor of both because we are gonna look at your current processes, we are gonna make recommendations on how those can be improved, but we're also gonna look as far back as we can to get you that closure that you're looking for. Did that answer your it question? It did, thank you very much. Great. 
Thank you. That ends the five questions. I'm going to open it up. And uh, Councilmember Berentine, since you were not one that got to ask, if you want to answer, ask one. If you like. um, so uh, a lot of this is taking that hundred, and then making a decision, going through, seeing if they followed the process and procedure, the bid process, the contract process, and whether they went out of the scope of their their. Uh, Mandates, therefore, and then um, the uh, that that clears that up. Um, the uh, question that uh, came up before, and I think it's a good one, is that uh, the people that are on the board, most of our directors are less than two years. Uh, I think all of the EF board members that sit by their director positions are less than a year, maybe one's two or something. Uh, so you don't have any historical knowledge or you don't have any, um, you don't have a, a lot to go on with that. Did you uh, uh, take that into account with how you were going to work with the audit and maybe potentially having to talk to people that are outside this organization? We can talk to anyone who is recommended to us to talk to. So if the council member or if the uh, management of EEF says, you know, I've only been in this p position for two years. However, Bob Smith is my predecessor and either he still works for the city or he's retired, but we call him on a fairly regular basis and I can put you in touch with him. We can get a, a, in touch with anyone that needs to be talked with. If it gets to the point where it's not looking great in terms of our results and what we're finding. Uh, at that point, we might come to the city and say, hey, even though these people haven't agreed to talk to us, we might want to try to get them involved and, and uh, see if they'll be willing to talk to us anyway and see what direction the city wants to take this in, if they're looking in terms of a legal direction or if they're still looking for an audit result out of that. And that might depend on, determine who we talk to. Uh, but we would try to, we would attempt to get the most information that we can from the sources that are available. Anyone else? Mayor Partem? Um, one of the statements that you made earlier <clears throat> was that as we're going along, if we see that we don't like the direction it is going, you, we can change gears on the fly. So what will that do to the um, the price that you've quoted to us if we change on the fly? Sure, uh, I'll probably put the lawyer answer out there that says it depends, but uh, it kind of does depend. It depends on what you're asking for. If you're saying, you know, we don't want to do a judgmental sample anymore, we'd like to do, or we don't want to, excuse me, we don't want to do a statistically valid sample anymore, we'd like to do a judgmental sample, there may be a few extra hours in terms of us making judgment because when you do a statistically valid sample, we run a random number generator and it says, here's your testing selections and that's it. And that's, and we give that list to the city and they pull the information for us and then we audit that. Uh, judgmental, we go through it in a, with a finer tooth comb and say, what do we think is interesting here? Some of that might come out of the data analytics. I don't think that would add too much cost to it. I would say the primary cost driver on that would be if you want us to look at 200 transactions instead of 100. If you do want to adjust on the fly, you can look at our proposal and see where the budget breakdown is and easily recalculate that. We'd be happy to do that for you as well. If there's, uh, say there's another firm that says we're gonna look at 200 transactions, you say, well, what if CICN looked at 200? We can give you a revised estimate on that. Um, and before we make any changes, before there's any cost, we would come back to you and say, based on what you're asking for, here's how that would affect the cost. But again, unless you're changing the number of transactions or drastically changing what we'd look at, I don't see it changing the cost very much. Thank you. Any further questions? I have a couple, but I... I, I guess I, I do have one more point to that. If it does get bad in terms of what we're looking at and the, the, the results that we're uh, come to and they need further a further forensic like uh, we really need to um, I'm trying to think of what would change that um, well uh, if we found a potential fraud then you're going to want to investigate it further and if you investigate it further it's going to cost more to do that so, so we could the end if you want to prosecute somebody or 
if they're still an employee and we're going to fire them or whatever we're going to do, uh, we'd have to be able to support that to back it up. So. So we can finish the audit as we have proposed in our proposal. Uh, again, if there's no major changes, it should be about the same price. What Larry's saying and what we're, we're saying here is that if we find fraud and you want to invest, you want us to investigate the fraud, that's almost a different engagement. We could still do it, but it might require, it would probably, it would probably require more resources to investigate the fraud. If we just say, these transactions were not appropriately approved, these transactions should have gone out to bid and weren't, uh, that's one thing. If we say, if you then say, hey, all these transactions that shouldn't have gone out to bid and weren't, uh, we want you to dive into those really deep and try to do an actual investigation, look at, uh, do research, looking up these companies that did the business for it, um, trying to find out if there's related parties, uh, looking at uh, public uh, records and relationships between parties and really opening up a fraud investigation, that's what would change the price as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I uh, just have a couple. One is, um, what do you think might be the most challenging part of this particular audit? Off the top of my head, it's going to be getting records that go back yeah. that far. Um, and Larry and I were talking about this before. Uh, I, I would actually be surprised if the city is able, if the EEF is able to produce those records. I think that's going to be the most challenging part. I think what we're going to wind up doing is finding that date to which the records go back and saying this is going to be our start date and putting that into the audit. Um, other than that, I'm not really seeing big challenges to it, assuming, assuming that we have the city's cooperation for everything, which I would assume that we would. Um, I think our biggest challenge is just getting the data perhaps talking to people, if there's people that we need to talk to that are lo no longer accessible. Uh, and in that case, we'd probably just try to do the best we can to reach people, but if we can't, we just have to rely on the information that we have. Unless it's something that turns into a fraud investigation where we need to start uh, expanding that scope. So I, I guess a follow-up to that then is, you, you made a statement earlier, one of you did, that cities often don't have documents going back as far as this goes. What, what's the norm that you usually find? In the industry, it's seven years. Seven, seven years. years, so, okay. All right. And then my second question is, how would we help you be the best at what you're doing? What would we need to do to make you very successful at, at really turning all the stones? Cooperation, time frame, time frame being a key, especially if you guys have a deadline that you're really trying to meet uh, to work with us on that. If we give you a list of transactions that we need pulled, and ask if they be polled in two weeks. We, we'd probably work with you guys to say, what's a reasonable amount of time for you to get everything polled for us? And if you say two weeks and we show up two weeks later and we're here on site and someone says, oh, sorry, yeah, we didn't get those polled, that's going to hinder us. But that's probably going to be the biggest uh, thing is just the city's help in getting the documentation that we need. We have a couple more minutes. Any other questions, Council? Member Cuesta? Uh, of those 100 transactions that you would select out of the 6,500, now as, as we've just gone over, all 6,500 might not be available. Uh, but of those 6,500, how do you decide which 100 you're going to uh, review? Is it just totally random? It's totally random, and it needs to be for it, for a statistically valid sample, it needs to be random. So for a judgmental sample, it does not. How is that randomized? How do you go about that? There's a random number generator in Excel. It generates a number, we uh, the rand between function within Excel. Uh, we can generate uh, 100,000 numbers and then we just sort and we pick the first 100 that fall out there. So it, it would be a completely random. Like I said, you guys might want to limit it to, so that we're not looking at transactions under $100. If, you're cons if you want to make sure that things that should have gone out to bid did, you might want to find out where that bid threshold is and say all of these should have gone out to bid. Um, Let's focus it on that. Uh, very good. Uh, uh, the open question that I have, and I think it's going to be more for staff, uh, the group prior, they seem to have a greater confidence in how far our data goes back. Um, I, too, am a, am a bit skeptical that we're going to be able to have every single transaction going back to 97. Uh, so that, to me, is kind of an unanswered question. I'm not sure if we've had that conversation with staff yet. We, we probably can't answer that tonight. And that's uh, not tonight, but yeah. I think we got to figure yeah. that out. So. If you have it, we can look have at them. it. We can do them. <laughs> that's for sure. And like I said, if you have just the data of the transactions, we could still do the data analysis, but we're not going to be able to tell whether something 
did go out to bid at Fitch. And, and there's really no way to do that. I, I saw that once on a proposal about five years ago, and that was the one that they looked for. They wanted to see every transaction, and we gave them a price on every transaction. Um, and I've seen firms, I, I guess one thing to keep an eye out when you're taking a look at uh, firms' proposals is ask yourself, do I think this is reasonable to, to do this? I know there was one firm that said, we can do it in this amount of time, and we can look at all your transactions. And if you do the math on it, you get down to it, and you say, how long is that firm spending on each transaction? And there was one proposal I looked at, and the firm was proposing to spend 23 seconds on each transaction. So you're going to tell me that you can determine if that's a valid transaction, if it was put out to bid, if it was approved by the appropriate person, not just anyone, you're going to do that in 23 seconds. It just doesn't make sense. Just something to keep in mind. I don't know if that's the case or not. I, I just remember seeing that as a bidder, and I thought, well, you know, I could see if I didn't know everything that there was to know about auditing, I might say, oh, well, this firm's less expensive, or they can look at all of the transactions. Great, let's go with them. But can they really, and can they to the degree that you want them looked at to be able to put this to bed? Thank you. Our our last uh, question really is to get some ideas of what next steps would look like for you. Sure. Well, if you choose us as a firm, we would, whatever date that you choose, we'd find a date that works for both the city and our firm to commence work on the project. Uh, we would likely start with the list of transactions. We'd ask the city what, how far back they can go in terms of the ac actual documentation to be able to reliably pull stuff. If there's one year where you have about every other transaction, we probably want to start with the first year where you can reliably say, yes, we should have everything for this particular year. Make our sample selection, have the city pull it, come in, start looking at it, um, and then update, provide updates every couple of weeks on where we are, what we've seen, and what, where we intend to go as well. So we've looked at 50 of the transactions, we have 50 left, we have some data analytics work we have left to do, um, and have that open dialogue with the city. Great. Thank you very much for your time with us and explaining so thoroughly. Um, your PowerPoints, can we have those electronically or sent, yes, I sent to you? Have them. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Council will take a five-minute breather.
mic on that in order for it to... Yeah. Well, the speaker from that comes with the gas. That's just from over here. You just have to definitely make sure you're holding the mic so the speaker can speak nice and loud and speak into your ear. Okay. Whenever you guys are answering or asking a question. Yes. So you'll be the... that yeah I am because I forgot my giant mounds of paperwork from the last time I was going on. Yeah because I was looking through electronically and then I was like oh yeah we only had it in paper copy. Party started. <laughs> oh, did I say that? Was I in speaker? <laughs> Is this the first that we've done with one of these before? Okay. We did some before with the boarding commission interviews on Skype, but I don't think we've done okay. like a meeting in here on okay. Skype. It several times to make sure it didn't work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi there. I don't think you can actually see me, but I will. <laughs> I think in the one that's maybe not in it, can you see the whole room? Mm -hmm. Most of it? I can see the world, but I can't see you. Yep. I, yep. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> You'll see the rest now. <laughs> All right, so our, uh, we're, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves. You probably already have seen this. You've been, been watching, but at least, you know, have a little bit of a breaking the ice with our voices. So I'm Linda Olson, Mayor Pro Tem, and, or Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Prayer, and also District 2 representative. So we'll go on here to the left. You look like Vanna White with that thing. <laughs> Rob Barentine, I'm District 3. Both Daniel Sierra, District 1. Amy Martinez, council member at large. I'm Cheryl Wink. I'm a council member at large. Dave Quest at District 3. Rita Russell, council member at large and mayor pro tem. Thank you. And yeah, you can, you can see us all okay, right? Yes, I can. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's good to know. Okay, our director Sabat is going to just kick us off here really quickly. Okay, I have a bigger role for this particular presentation. I'm actually going to be doing the slides. Um, but I'd like to introduce Melissa Frick Minnick. She's the principal and audit manager for Marsh Minnick. Um, she is the um, last uh, presentation uh, for the evening to uh, uh, present to you the Englewood em Environmental Foundation audit proposal that uh, Marsh Minnick sub uh, submitted. So with that, I'll turn that over to you, Melissa. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but we just lost your audio. There you are. Now you're there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, now we can.
That way you all can ask the questions that you have. Um, I want to talk about Marsh Minick, our company. I want to talk to you about um, past work examples that are similar to the EVE audit that we are reading that you're looking for. Um, I have a little bit about what our basic understanding is of the EVE audit. Um, and the purpose of the audit, as well as uh, a section for the Q&A. So I'm going to try and um, put this into the same context um, of the five questions that you guys have put out there and try and cover at a high level some of those things through the presentation. And then uh, about us on slide three there. So I'm Melissa frick -Minick. I'm the audit manager and one of the principals here at our firm. The other principal is Brandy Marsh, and together we're Marsh and Minnick. Uh, we're a small women-owned business. Um, we are domiciled in Portland, Oregon, and we conduct nationwide services, and we... Audio. Audio. Okay. How about now? Yeah, it's fine. I'm not sure why it goes out once in a while, but it may just be the uh, internet. I don't know. Probably. Um, so we specialize in forensic auditing, financial crime, compliance, and risk management engagements. So comparing and contrasting the prior two firms I just listened to, they seem very heavily ingrained in CPA and audit uh, of all varieties where we really specialize in providing um, one type of audit services regarding fraud, waste, abuse, or mismanagement allegations. So we have been um, performing as a team together since 2003. We started in banking. That, we lost, we lost audio. audio. Okay. Now we can hear you. Now, chair. Yes. Okay, great. So we um, have been auditing since 2003 together, um, doing financial crime. After 9-11 happened, that's where we got into this specific industry. Brandy and I are both certified fraud examiners. We're also uh, certified financial crime investigators. And um, cumulatively, we have 35 years experience in um, this area of fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement. Um, and go to the next slide for me, please. Thank you. So I'd, I'd like to talk to you guys through some of our past um, that some of our past audits that we've done that are similar to what we think. Here is what we did. You need, um, you need to probably not move because it kind of fades in and out. I don't know if that's what it's related to. Um, so you want to say something so I can hear you? Is that better? That is. Okay. So um, the first past audit I'd like to go through with you guys is one we did in Saline County, Illinois. And it was a forensic audit of the county clerk and recorder's office. And the audit was ordered by the county board. So kind of like how you guys are providing an oversight as a board for this independent agency, Eve, the county here in Saline County is providing oversight to the clerk's office. You tried it out again. The county was opposed to forensic audit. So this one required um, us to have the nest when going in and collecting information and looking for the fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, this was a highly publicized audit. The news media followed this one quite extensively. And it's because the allegations of fraud, waste, and abuse were very serious, and the public was quite concerned. 
And so we conducted this audit under quite a bit of scrutiny by the public and by the media. And we've noticed for the EVE audit, the media is following what happened. So um, it will be similar in that regard. Um, additionally, for this audit, um, it's a very similar audit timeline that we've proposed for you guys, which is three months. And it's the same audit phases that we've proposed for you guys in your proposal. So if you um, would like to view an audit report, a sample audit report, what your deliverable would look like, I encourage you to follow the link that's provided on this slide at your own leisure at the bottom there, and you can read the news article, and you can look at our audit report that was published to the public, okay? Um, in this situation, we discovered over a million dollars had been misappropriated by the county clerk from taxes that were levied from the public. I do encourage you to look at this one just because you can go out and see our actual report. It, it's an example of what you would get at the end of your audit, okay? And if you look at the next slide for me, slide five, please. Thank you. So the next audit I'd like to go over with you is one that we did in Arkansas. This was in Little Rock, Arkansas, where, again, the You're fading out. Okay. And now it's okay. Okay, great. Thank you. So in this case in Arkansas, the county was providing oversight for a recreational district. Okay, kind of, again, just like how you guys are exerting your oversight authority. And so what we did is we went in and did the examination of this property. It was a community facility for the public. It was a, a pool, a tennis court, and a park that um, was supposed to be renovated, um, but sadly, all of the money was misappropriated. Look like when we audited. You're fading out some. I uh, hope this is better. Yes. Um, excellent. If you can see in these pictures of the pool, it was in very bad shape, okay? This is what we saw when we went on site to audit. So what we learned was that the commissioners who were Faded out again. Thank you. The commissioners in charge of the district had um, misused over $90,000 of the renovation funds for the community. And this one's unique, similar to the EF audit, because we had to go in this audit, which is similar to your EF audit, which is requesting us to go back for several decades as well. Um, so that's an example of the one audit there. Can we move to the next page, please? Another example of an audit is um, the Washoe tribe. This tribe is located in Nevada. The Indian uh, Council had ordered an audit of their housing authority. Again, this was an oversight authority requesting an audit of an oversight entity. And the housing authority is responsible for developing property uh, within the reservation and providing housing for the um, for their um, people in their tribe. And sadly, their money was being misappropriated um, through corruption and conflicts of interest. It's a million dollars. Hopefully this is better. Okay, yes. What we discovered is there was five or six million dollars that was misappropriated from the Washoe Housing Authority. In this specific audit, we looked at internal controls and there was a deficiency of internal controls. We looked at misuse of the credit card transactions and found suspicious activity. We looked at cash advances that were taken, also suspicious. 
There were inappropriate bonuses issued that were suspicious. There was construction expenditures against the federal regulation of um, grant expenditures, and so that was suspicious, as well as they commingled money. When we looked at their financial transactions and their financial system, they were uh, commingling money in an inappropriate way um, to cover the fraud that was happening. And additionally, we looked at the travel expenses for the housing authority. Um, this was a very extensive audit that we did for um, the tribe, um, and this is one of the ones we did last year. And then, would you go to the next one for me, please? Page seven. This last one here I'd like to quickly overview for you is a fraud investigation, less an audit, where the others were more audits. This one was actually a fraud investigation, and this one was the states uh, hopefully it's clear again I see grabbing your microphone yes uh, the secretary of state's office required um, that an audit be conducted of the Oregon Department of Energy's business this was a very large investigation that had to be done within three month time frame so the very same similar three month time frame we proposed to you only in this situation, we had to look at over 14 that totaled almost $2.4 billion in a state program. Um, there's also a link provided on this page. I encourage you as well to click this link at your leisure and go look at the audit report from this investigation. It's another example of the deliverable. And um, we've also provided a snapshot of the news media and in the end, we discovered there was over $300 million in wrongful tax credits that were issued by the state of Oregon. And um, this led to a prosecution of a state employee who did go to jail for uh, corruption. They were taking bribes from companies engaged in this tax credit. Um, next slide for me, please. Page eight. Okay, so I'm going to transition away from past assignments and sort of transition into your EAF audit here. Before we bid our, on the proposal that you've received, we reviewed the news media that's been publicized about this. We also. Fading out some. Okay, thank you. We did look at your past agendas and watch some of your past board meetings and did um, an awareness that you are looking for a, a quasi-forensic audit, quasi-performance audit, um, because there have been allegations that have been raised, and it sounds like you guys want a complete answer on whether fraud happened, quantify how much, and make meaningful recommendations to improve this program going forward for your community. And so um, that's really a blended audit is what we're calling it, a forensic and performance auditing. So um, we recognize this is a developed property. It's the original Cinderella site. And that the EIF is a separate organization from the city, which is actually quite common of the engagements that we have. Would you, would you restate that, please, what you just said, because it was breaking up. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, similar to how um, your office is, um, your city is, is a separate organization from EAF um, financially, in Okay, can you repeat that also because we didn't hear the full sentence. Okay, I'm sorry. I wish the internet was a little better. Um, so what I was saying was that with EAF being a separate organization from the city, that's a I don't know why you're um, breaking out, but uh -huh. I don't know. Okay, I could hear. I can hear you now. Okay, great. <laughs> It's the commercial. Can you hear me now? 
that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> I appreciate you guys hanging in here with me. Um, okay. So, um, so as I was saying, we understand that ETH is a separate entity than the city and that um, you all are wanting us to look at the financial transactions going back um, to the 90s and that there are over 2,000 transactions that um, would need to be examined in order for there to be a 99% confidence on your auditing. Um, and what that does, it reassures you and the public that you have had a meaningful audit, a large majority of your transactions. Also, what we think you are looking for is, as I said, you're breaking up a little bit again. We provide an evidence-based report of findings, so we do not provide an opinion-based report of findings. If you look at those sample audit reports I referred you to, you'll see we actually provide images of records that we found that prove um, there might be mismanagement, fraud, waste, or abuse, so you can rely on evidence-based um, facts. This also helps the court. If you have to, after our case, go to court, you know, a criminal or civil action, our evidence-based report will be so comprehensive that this will support your next step endeavors if that's the way to go about this. You understand that you're looking to make, to look at the whole accounting and see where are the problems um, with the accounting and quantify those. We think you also want a independent It, hang in. just a second. Is it is it possible for you to call? Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, do you have two? Are you using two screens? Um, no. Okay, just just wanting to make sure because we're not quite seeing your whole heads or wondering if in the positioning. But if you want to call in differently, um, could you can you do a Skype call and a Skype video at the same time? I think that would be really smart. Um, 303-503-4020. I better take it off of airplane mode. Hang on. Can you say that again? 303-503-4020. Yeah. Okie doke. Great job with the mic, by the way. <laughs> well, I could see her mouth moving, but.
report from the Judicial District Attorney's Office from 2017 where they had issued somewhat an inconclusive report that says it didn't warrant a criminal investigation, but the public still had interest in, in really getting to the matter of, of how what happened, was anything done that was improper, and um, really just get some confidence back in, in the EVE program. Now, would you go to the next slide for me, please? Slide nine. So as I said, we want to do a blended audit, a blended forensic audit with a performance audit. So because there are allegations going into this, that means there's predicate to do a forensic audit. You must have a predicate. There must be allegations to do a forensic audit. And because those exist, it is appropriate to call it in some way a forensic audit. However, we recognize that there is a performance aspect to this as well. You want to make improvements with your EAF organization. You want us to evaluate current processes and make meaningful recommendations. And so for that regard, it's sort of a quasi-blended audit that would be done here. We conduct risk-based examinations which means that we focus on the greatest area where fraud, risk, waste, abuse, mismanagement, compliance issues are going to exist. So we hone into the most risky areas. We evaluate the internal controls by looking at policies and procedures. We interview extensively with current and past employees and board members any other in parties that may have information. We um, evaluate all of the financial transactions and conduct a like a 99% confidence level sampling of your transactions. I had um, calculated what that would be earlier with a 6,500 population of transactions at a 99% confidence level. That means we're going to be looking at minimum 2,537 transactions. Okay. And we do this using a forensic auditing software that assists us um, with analyzing data. It's called IDEA Casework Analytics, and it's a forensic audit best practice. And then one of the things that I um, want to make sure you heard before, I wasn't sure if the phone was working great, was we deliver a fact-based report of findings, not an opinion. So everything that we put in there is going to be based on evidence and facts, which makes it easy to stand behind and um, to prove um, the, the actual end result of the audit because you're going to have the evidence to substantiate why the audit ended in that regard. And we also provide meaningful improvement recommendations. That's a part of the performance aspect of the audit, making sure that the recommendations are realistic and meaningful. And I think that's the end of our presentation, and hopefully we can get into your Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I really appreciate your hanging in there with us with the technology. So we have five questions, and uh, different council members will ask them. If they feel like you have thoroughly covered it, they may ask the question, but then answer ask something else as well. So uh, I think I'll start with Council Member Martinez, uh, I, and I hope you'll be able to hear this. So let me. T I can hear you. Okay, yeah, I can shout. No, use use your mic. <laughs> Just use your mic. Yeah. Okay. Right, right into it, like you know, like, like this. Like right up to it. Yes. Okay. Is this is this too close? Nope. nope. Okay. It feels too can close. You, can okay. you hear her? Yes. Okay. No, thanks. Um, uh, the first question is: Please describe your understanding of the audit. I believe you answered that in pretty good detail. So, is it okay if I ask a, a different question? Um, I was able to find the link that you provided in the first sample of the um, forensic audit finding report, and I do see it is very detailed. So I have two questions. Um, one, all of the samples that you uh, provided show um, findings of some type of fraud. Um, have you done reports where fraud was not found? So an audit that's not fraud-oriented? 
No, no the were question you was whether yeah. or not you've done audits where fraud was not found. Yeah, okay. Um, th thank you for clarifying. That's what I was thinking you said. Thank you. Yes, we also do risk-based audits where you actively seek out risks, proactive risks to improve internal controls, and compliance auditing where um, a city or county municipality needs to ensure they're adhering to regulations or laws and doing compliance auditing, as well as performance auditing. But we do specialize in the forensic audit field. So Most all of our investigations and cases and audits are going to have some type of allegation of noncompliance, a risk, mismanagement, fraud, waste, or abuse. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm clear. So every uh, in every um, example of uh, where you've done a forensic audit, you have found that fraud did occur. Not everyone, but majority of them, yes, because there's a predicate that's having us come in there, right? There's some kind of concern, whether that be compliance or risk deficiency or internal control deficiency or actual allegation of fraud or corruption. So there's always some kind of predicate. Um, but sometimes we find that there may be nothing wrong. Um, but in most cases, there's ways to improve. And so our recommendations are always ways to improve. Great. And then I have a second follow-up question to that. So the um, report that I'm just briefly viewing is very detailed and uh, very thorough. And I'm wondering if in the instances where it fraud was not found, if it's also st still this thorough to help, you know, um, support uh, your findings. In the reverse. Yes, if fraud is not found, the audit report is equally as comprehensive. We follow the evidence. So if the evidence takes us down a path of nothing concerning, no fraud, no waste, no abuse, no mismanagement, then the evidence is going to paint that path in the report. Um, it's not a matter of opinion, as you you know, can recall me mentioning that. So, um, so it's really where your data takes us, where the interviews take us. That's what the end, re you know, report is going to reflect. And because we're independent parties, we have, you know, zero connection to Englewood or the East or any of the people in your community. So that really does ensure that we are literally following the data and evidence. There's no other motive behind it for us other than to give you guys answers that you're seeking and the public the answers that they're seeking. Sure, and I appreciate that clarification. Just wanted to make sure that the um, findings would be this thorough no matter what. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. All right, Council Member Sierra. <coughs> Do you mind going back to the previous slide, Director Sabata? Uh, the, the original question was um, to describe in detail similar aud audits that you have conducted, and I think we did discuss that I think we did discuss that at length, although the audio was breaking up, but I think um, we were still able to get a good understanding of it. I think regarding, um, actually, the slide before this, uh, Maria, uh, Director Sabata, I think I may have misunderstood her. I, I just need some clarification. I think uh, within the slide itself, I believe you may have mentioned that um, that, you know, you, you're working on, a, on an audit, but then um, didn't find wrong, wrongdoing, but then you did hear from the citizens that there were specific instances that they needed additional information on. I'm not sure if I understood this correctly. I think it was around the allegations and coverage in the news media, but was there something that I missed there in terms of just something that, uh, I think this is just, uh, just for my misunderstanding about what was discussed here within the e, uh, the EF audit. Um, are you able to go over the slide again? Because I think I just must have misunderstood exactly what the, the takeaway was here. Yes, thank you. I appreciate you asking to do that just because it, you know, was cutting out and this one pretty bad. Okay, so what I was saying here is before we proposed um, the, the bid that we sent to you, we had done some legwork to anticipate what your needs were. Some ways we did that was review the news media coverage that has come out, um, as well as look at how was EAF formed. So we saw that EAF was formed to um, remediate, improve, maintenance, and develop the Cinderella property, the Cinderella site, 
to a current, um, I think it's like a city center type um, building or uh, facility, I should say, to its present day. So we did go back and look at how was Eve created, um, what are the risks in this specific type of an organization with managing property and um, geared our proposal towards this type of organization. Additionally, we identified that ETH is a separate organization from the city, but the city obviously has an interest and a quasi uh, oversight function of this organization. So we had seen that, you know, that's um, a large aspect to this, and so that was part of our proposal. Additionally, we saw the allegations in the news that there might be overpayment for services that may have occurred. There may be misallocation of money. Um, there's been some news reports about possible kickbacks, bribery, conflicts of interest. And we saw news media about um, possible change of ownership or change in um, the assets itself and um, some questions related to that. And um, we saw that the public simply seems to want reassurance that there wasn't wasteful spending, that there wasn't fraud. They want some reassurance that this organization has been operating in their best interest. And so that's sort of what led to us creating the proposal. We also watched your council session videos, and we looked at some of your past um, agendas for your council session, and we reviewed the Judicial District Attorney's Office report from 2017 as well. That, that clarifies it. Thank you very much. Councilmember Barentine. Um, I, I think you've already gone over the process that you're going to be using. Uh, one question that's come up because we have such a, such a high turnover in all of the directors, the directors who hold the position in EIF, um, I think, are less than a year. Uh, so there's not a lot of historical knowledge there. Have you built in the... Um, into your audit uh, pricing, uh, the opportunity maybe to go outside of the current staff to get information, um, whether that's going to be an additional cost, it, is that part of it? We fully anticipate to go beyond the current staff. That's completely normal for our engagements. Most of our audits, there has been significant turnover, significant program problems. Oftentimes they expand, um, you know, seven years or greater, okay? So what we do is we have an investigative technology, and we track people down using that. We look for their current address, their current phone number, and we call them and see if they're interested in doing a telephone interview. What we found is that for people who are no longer, um, you know, working for the city or working for East, they are best to reach over the phone. They do not want to come and meet in person. So when we um, contact them, we do as our investigative database, we contact them and we do a phone interview with them. And it allows us to do the information gathering about um, what happened um, beyond what the current staff knows, especially when you lose institutional knowledge there. We do go and get that from past employees, and that is a part of our price is doing that. Right. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Russell. Um, the one question, would you be traveling out here at all to meet with us or, okay. Yeah. Yes, so um, all of our forensic um, audits and compliance audits, all of our assignments, we come out and do what we call an on-site visit. So we will have an introductory meeting with you all. We will have an introductory meeting with the EAF um, board and the EAF management. And then we do the on-site gathering of information. Typically, the on-site gathering of information lasts a week. And during that time, we interview all the staff that is on site, all the board members and other people with information um, to get us going in the examination. So we call that the um, on-site inspection part. Um, then from there, we conduct all of our forensic testing um, from our offices in Portland, Oregon.
again. And then we give you um, the choice of whether you want us to come back and deliver the audit report in person or whether you want us to do it orally in a similar capacity to where we're doing that now. That's really a choice that you guys have. And it's usually budget-oriented for our clients, whether they want us to come back or not um, to deliver in person or orally. So that would not be included in the price that you've quoted to us if you come back the second time? We do have a not to exceed price, which does include um, the initial on-site visit for the week. So if you want us to come back in the end, what we do is we just reserve um, the allocation within our not to exceed price so we can come back to do that for you. Okay, thank you. I had another question, but I will come back to you. Okay. <clears throat> Councilmember Cuesta. Thank you. Uh, the question that I have uh, in front of me according to the uh, scheduled questions is please describe how the audit processes work. I feel like I have that answered if you don't mind me going to a, a, another question. Uh, Melissa, if I understood you correctly, you've been told there's 6,500 transactions and it would take you 2,537 to get a 99% uh, confidence result. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, let, uh, let me ask you this. The gentleman and or, or the, the prior group, they thought they could do it in 100. Why do you think you need 2,500? Oh, well, please, please explain that to me. What do you think the difference is there? Well, um, in a traditional audit firm, like your other two proposers, they are looking at a much smaller sample size, usually, like your 100 example here. And because they're looking whether fraud exists at all, okay? If fraud exists within those hundreds, then they usually follow the path from there and look for fraud. In this case, what we do is we know there's already allegations of fraud, which means it's warranted that you guys have a 99% confidence level, okay? Also, you're, like as an example, the 100 um, transactions, that's only a 95% confidence level, I think he said. Okay, so that's the difference there. Also, we only give a 2% margin of error in our 99%, where they were giving you a 10% margin of error, which is a confidence interval. So we provide a much more thorough uh, audit because we know there's allegations, and so we always try and achieve that level of statistical sampling. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Wink? I have no questions. No questions? I think we started with... Did we start with you, Councilmember Martin? You want to ask a question? Uh, ask or, or I think that Mayor Pro Tem Russell had another question, so let's go with it, and then I'll ask. One. I I had one, and I I just remembered it. If <clears throat> if there is evidence of fraud found, would you provide testimony or expert witness to help us? Absolutely, we would do that. I would say that's one of the only scenarios where that would be an addendum to our contract because then you're asking us to do, you know, next step. It's no longer an audit. What we're talking about is perhaps prosecuting somebody or perhaps going through a court-oriented proceeding. And that's a different scope in general. But every single audit we do, we anticipate that it may go to court at some point in time because we're always in the fraud, waste, abuse, mismanagement, compliance category. So um, the good news is, is all of the work we do, if you, let's say, have to work with a, your state's attorney or a prosecutor, they love working with us because we have all of the evidence and the chain of procedures that they want. They have all the information in a manner that will help them go to court because we provide the evidence. And um, we have the experience dealing with, um, you know, sadly, financial crime. So what happens is, you know, in many of our cases, there are people doing fraud and it does lead to prosecution. So this is a normal course of our business is supporting you after the audit if the legal need is necessary. Um, one of the examples we provided, it was the last example I provided uh, where we had the large state um, tax credit, the 350 something million dollars that we found that was wrong. In that case, 
um, we had to re send a separate report to the Oregon Department of Justice and the Oregon Department of Justice had to review our report in detail, and that's what led to the arrest and um, prosecution of the, the state employee that was taking kickback. So that's an example of where we've, we've kind of gone beyond and had to help with the legal aspect after our exam. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have I have a couple questions. Um, I just a technical question I wanted to ask you is uh, there was a. Uh, if you're going to go over 2,500 items, uh, what does that entail in terms of time per item? Is it a, simply uh, a statistical analysis of big data, or how? What what actually is that in terms of every succinct item? Right. So we have a system. It's called Idea Caseware Analytics, and um, so we upload all of the transactions that you have electronically, or when we go on site, if it's on paper, we gather the information and, and manually upload it into the system. Then what the system does is it has predefined forensic tests um, that it, it runs, and it will indicate to us where the transactions show red flags are, and it helps us narrow down where the risks are in all the financial transactions. Then we conduct our forensic testing. So let's say there's an allegation that a contractor uh, didn't go through the proper procurement practices. Then the system allows us to analyze all the transactions as an example for that particular vendor and slice that data in multiple different ways so we can see exactly where the animalities exist. And then we are able to also quantify what transactions are what we would call suspicious. When we identify certain transactions as suspicious, those are the ones we go and pull as much data about and then spend that time. You're asking, like, how, how much time per transaction? That's going to depend. If, if, if the, the suspicious transactions, how many ever there are, we're going to go pull the data and look at those in depth. So that's what I mean by risk-based auditing. We're looking for red flags, we're looking for suspicious activity, and then we follow it from there to really dive into it in a more deeper scale. So in this case, we would only look at the vendors as an example where the red flags were prominent based on our data analytics. We're not going to waste our time and look at vendors where there are no red flags present in their transactions or data. And so this system really helps us, and it's a fraud auditor's best tool, really, on the market um, to, to do this type of auditing in an effective and efficient manner. Thank you. If, if there are no uh, procurement policies that were being utilized and they're simply straightforward, you know, uh, I guess, vendor invoices or something and that's all we have, how, how would those be evaluated? Well, a lot of the times we have to look at the paper-based records that you have, looking at contracts, looking at the paperwork, the agreements that you have. In most of our cases, it's highly complex financial transactions um, that we have to sort of untangle and unweave and make sense of them. So, um, so really, it's just we have tuned our um, skill set to detect what is suspicious, what is red flags, and we focus in on those specific areas. Um, and then we, we will go and essentially investigate those transactions that are at risk. Um, because the other transactions that aren't at risk, we, you know, there's no predicate for us to go and examine them any further. All right, thank you. I'm going to ask if Council will have any further questions. All right, I, I'll ask my last two that I have been asking, um, which are first, what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge of this if you were to get this award for work? And then secondly, how would we make you, help you be as successful as you can be? I have a pretty decent idea as to um, the challenges, only because, again, most of our audits are in a very similar setup going into it. There's a board, the board decides that we go in and audit an entity in their purview. Um, so what we think is going to be the most challenging is looking at records 
beyond probably the 10 year mark. If you haven't electrically captured those and they're in paper based records, then we go out and we look for those records. We actively go look for those records. We don't just tell you, hey, can you pull these records and give them to us? No, we actively go out and look for those records. We don't just sit around on our hands waiting for you to direct us where to go. We know where to go based on the red flags and suspicious activity. And just like investigators, we turn on our investigator hat and we go find that data. So the challenge is um, how much data do you have and where do we have to flip that switch from, you know, general auditing data that's given to us to actually going and seeking out records that maybe haven't been provided to us that we really need to, to look for. So, so that can be the challenge, but um, truly I don't see that being a problem because, again, in most of our cases, we're going back um, many years in our examinations, as in the, the example there with the broken down pool, we went back into the 1970s. So it's completely common for us to have to go chase down records and information, though it is a challenge to do that. And then how would we help you be most successful? Okay. Um, I provide a weekly status report for our audits. Um, that helps us to stay in good communication as to what's going on. Also, we provide a draft report before we provide the final report, and we solicit your feedback along the way. So the best way that you can support us is providing us with um, communication where you see that there's an area you want us to kind of look into differently or examine things in a different light, and we listen to your feedback regarding that draft report to make sure that the final report in the end is a exactly what you guys are looking for. Some counties, some cities, some municipalities, they want the report to be made public and they want no names in the report. Others want names and others don't want it public. So those are the kinds of feedbacks that we'll be communicating as we go along to make sure we're meeting all of your expectations and needs for your, um, for, you know, for your audit here. Thank you. And our last uh, point of the content tonight is um, the next steps and what you see the next steps as being if we were to uh, decide to work with you. Excellent. So the next step from here is um, to do the contract engagement. Um, usually it's whatever we put in the proposal we use as um, the statement of work. So if you look at what's in the proposal, that, that pretty much translates into the statement of work section in the contract. Um, and then we agree on a start date. And then once we determine the start date, we send what's called an information request. And that helps you to understand what is some of the data we're going to request when we're on site for that initial week, like policies, like procedures, like financial transactions, et cetera. We tell you kind of overview what we're looking for. It helps you prepare. And then um, we come on site and we do those introductory meetings with you and with Eve. And then we literally go and start looking through all of the records and then conducting the interviews from there. So that's sort of like what really gets us into the audit is, is getting there on site and starting to go through your information. All right. Thank you. I, th I think that was helpful. Any, any further questions or concerns? No. Thank you so much and for going through our strange <laughs> bridge here of <laughs> audio and video. It worked. It worked much better. Yeah, I'm glad that I called on the phone. I think I can tell you guys could hear me so much better. Yeah, it was much better. I had to do this last week with someone, but it was Zoom, not Skype. Yeah, so thank you very much. Appreciate your time this evening. You too. You all look tired. Go home and get some nice rest. I appreciate you staying late for me. I get it. I get it. I'm, I'm with you there. I see your eyes. So uh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet all you. I hope you select us because truly we do specialize in this forensic work. And Brandy and my name is on all of our work. You're going to get the best quality work with us, you guys. Our name is on it. Our reputation is on the line. We're just not some companies, you know, people in a company – you know, our names are on the work, so you'll know you'll get, you know, top quality work at the best value and what we provided to you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care now. Bye. 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 All right. A few minutes before nine.
Uh, so we have a couple of options tonight. We can either uh, decide we have some sense of where we want to go right now with one of them, or we can wait until next uh, week for the study session and uh, discuss it then. I would suggest the latter because everybody does look really tired, but if, if you're all wanting... Is that even over Skype? Yeah, really. I know. <laughs> oh, it's so... Bad. Does that make sense to you? I, we have a full schedule next uh, Monday, but we will make sure that this is on it uh, because this is we're moving it to the next stage. Councilmember Barentine. I would go for the study session only because some people gave us some additional information that I think I would like to take a look at as well. Yep. Councilmember Martinez. I would prefer to wait as well. There's a lot to digest. Um, I would like to revisit their um, presentations that we got tonight, so I would like prefer to wait. Mayor Pro Tim Russell. Could I get a Yes, they're